Live from Emerald City in Seattle, Washington, the UFO, Bigfoot, and paranormal hotspot of the Pacific Northwest. Coming directly to you, listening in around the world. This, my friends, is Spaced Out Sunday. I'm your host, Michael W. Hall, the paranormal lawyer, occupying the captain's chair tonight at SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show, including all of our listeners on the digital side at Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always find out our about our archive shows for free at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do us all a favor, will you, and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at our Spaced Out Radio store, and catching up on the SOR Newswire and so much more. Tonight's show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by donating to Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. And tonight we are very, very uh, lucky to have a wonderful guest by the name of Mark Wozniak. He is an author. He is an actor, actually, and a uh, researcher into the unique and paranormal and including uh, uh, being a, uh, uh, a film critic uh, and a critic uh, of some really interesting television shows. We're talking uh, 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 Rod Serling's Twilight Zone, and we're talking uh, uh, Coal Shack. Some of those wonderful shows that were just written by some amazing authors back in the old television days. So Mark is going to be uh, with us in just a few moments. But, of course, we start off every top of the hour with our good friend Peter Davenport from the National UFO Reporting Center. And we're going to go into some of this UFO sighting reports that have been happening and coming into the National UFO Reporting Center from around the globe for the last uh, week or so. Uh, But first of all, let me welcome uh, Mark to the show. Mark, can you hear me, buddy? Oh, yeah, I can hear you just fine. All right, great. Well, we've got a good, uh, a really cool picture of you there uh, with your wonderful white shock of hair. You have one of the best hairdos I have ever seen on a, a, a mature man. Let me put it that way. Being one then myself, I, I really envy your, your hair. A kind description if I ever heard one. <laughs> <laughs> and then the first time I think I've ever been called mature, too. I think in the same breath. So, oh, my. Uh, well, you know, at one point we all get there, and uh, I'm a little older than, you, older than you are. So, yeah, definitely. And, and uh, Peter, uh, we uh, obviously uh, welcome you to the top of the hour every show. So are you there? I am here, Michael. Good evening. And it's great to be here. And good evening, Mark. Good evening. And we Pete, are really spread out geographically tonight, aren't we? We are indeed. We have the whole country covered. Oh my, yeah, I'm in Eastern Washington. I'm in Seattle. Peter is in uh, Eastern Washington, and and uh, Mark is out there in uh, Cayuga Falls, Ohio. Mm-hmm. Very nice. Um, by the way, Peter, if you can do us a favor, get close to that uh, uh, mouthpiece on the on the telephone. I think we got you down really good, much better than. Than before, but just stay close to that uh, microphone there. I think I'm getting careless, Michael. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> there you go. That, that's that's fantastic. Well, listen, uh, uh, Mark and I are going to co-host you as well for the first half hour here, Peter, like we always do here. So um, we're going to let you take it away and tell us what has been coming in across the country and maybe around the world as far as UFO sighting reports this last week. Well, Thank you. As always, <clears throat> thank you for having me on, Michael. It's always uh, a pleasure to work with you, and I'm really flattered to be a regular contributor to your program. What I'd like to do tonight is I've got five uh, re- recent reports starting on the 30th of July, Thursday morning, from uh, Elgin, Oklahoma, and just go through them and share with our audience some strange things that are reported to the National UFO Reporting Center. And uh, then, if we have any time left over, I'd like to talk about a few past sighting reports from 
not just years fast, but decades fast, and emphasize to the audience that we're every bit as interested in those past sighting reports from decades ago as we are more recent reports. But the first report I'd like to uh, share with our audience occurred on the 30th, the morning of the 30th of July, Thursday of last week. A gentleman writes from Elgin, Oklahoma, that he was uh, driving to work on that morning at about 5.12 in the morning when he became aware of a very strange light. And one of the points he makes and emphasizes is he's a veteran of the U.S. Army. So he's probably trained in proper observing observation technique. But uh, he describes a light that was coming towards him. This is in the vicinity of Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And uh, he saw a very bright light approaching, coming across a neighbor's house and flickering randomly. Then what caught his attention was as it got closer, the flickering nature of the light stopped and it suddenly became solid, solid white light. And then he realized it was much closer than he had allowed for or had assumed initially. It's very difficult to know how far away a light is from you at night. Uh, just can't be done that without triangulation from two or more points simultaneously. And that's when he realized that the object was about the size of a small American sedan. He began to see substance to, the, to its shape. It was no longer just a light. It circled a nearby tree and then he could, at which point he could tell that it was metallic and the light went back to a flickering nature, flickering pattern. So what it was, we'll never know, but clearly not an aircraft, clearly not a satellite, clearly not a weather balloon or a drone, so it uh, seems to default to being something outside our our uh, scope of understanding. Very interesting report. Wow. Peter, did he uh, happen to tell you how it disappeared? Did it just flick out or what? That's the one thing he doesn't talk about. Oh, yes, he does. I'm sorry. I'm scanning the report as I speak. He says after it had circled the tree and hovered for a moment, giving him an opportunity to look at it, he says then it immediately shot straight up in the air. Thank you for reminding me of that, Michael. Wow. Uh, I overlooked that, but this is not uncommon. You've heard me s describe events very similar to that. Yeah. Uh, when objects just suddenly shoot off into the night, in this case, straight up. You know, you know, Mark, so, this, this happens quite often, uh, Peter's reports, where it's almost as if they're trying to get our attention you know, for some reason, and all of a sudden they just zip out. They just disappear. I mean, not disappear, but they just zip away very quickly. Um, yeah. And obviously we've always thought that, you know, there's no real reason for these UAP UFOs to have lights on them at all. You know, they probably could cloak if they wanted to, and here they are flitting around, uh, you know, kind of getting our attention and, and, and zipping off. So very fascinating report. Peter, was this, this this gentleman's first encounter with something like this? He doesn't address that issue, but that's a good question, Mark. And mm -hmm. I will attempt to write him back and ask whether he's ever seen one. But at one point, after he describes his background in the military, he points out that uh, uh, he's 100% convinced that this was a UFO. So that doesn't address your question, I recognize, but uh, it sounds as though he's familiar with the UFO phenomenon. Well, it's 100% it was, because he saw something and he doesn't know what it was. <laughs> so. it's un unidentified, and obviously it was flying. There we are. <laughs> flying in a very peculiar fashion. Mm -hmm. The uh, second report, Michael, I'd like to touch on tonight 
comes from two days after the sighting in Oklahoma. This is from Sebago, Maine. I've been there, actually, when I lived in New Hampshire. This is from the 1st of uh, Saturday evening, the 1st of August, so eight days ago. A gentleman writes that uh, at exactly 2041 hours, 8.41 p.m., they were uh, sitting outside looking at the night sky, three witnesses, when they saw two lights approaching from the east, Heading uh, and they passed directly overhead, so they're in a very good position to estimate the ground track of the direction the object was moving. Actually, two objects. They saw two very, very bright points of light. The one in the lead was uh, about twice or three times the size of the one following it, going directly to the west. Uh, about 300 degrees or northwest and uh, the lead object as he says was as he writes was many times brighter than the object trailing it and they were traveling at the same speed uh, he estimates that the larger object was approximately three quarters the diameter of a full moon which is a very sizable very prominent object in the night sky <clears throat> but uh, the fact that it was traveling to the west tends to militate against any possibility that it could have been a satellite because satellites almost never fly to the west they always are in a polar orbit or have an easterly component to their ground track and also, after the sighting, the gentleman had the presence of mind to find out where the International Space Station was at the time of his sighting, and it was over the Gulf of Mexico, so we can rule out the International Space Station, or ISS. Very interesting sighting. Oh, my. Uh, I mean, it, when you're talking something that's... You know, uh, that's a good perspective when he's telling you that it's three quarters the size of a full moon, because we all can pretty much gauge, you know, in our mind how big the full moon normally is. Uh, sometimes it's even bigger than we we remember on certain nights when the uh, refracted, uh, you know, atmosphere is not so so full. But that's quite large. That's a big object. Very prominent object in the nighttime sky. So uh, it's a very good report. And I talked to this gentleman. He was very convincing, very mature, very eloquent, and he writes very well. Those are all good signs of a person who's a good witness and a good, reliable uh, individual, reporter of fact. Yeah. So, it and it sounds to me he probably didn't uh, hear anything or have any other um, sensory uh, feeling of this thing going by. It just was silent, huh? Silent. He doesn't address, to the best of my knowledge, he doesn't address whether there was any uh, light but he, or any sound. But he says the only color he saw was white light and there were no strobes on it no red or green marker lights that would have been characteristic of a conventional aircraft. He's familiar enough with aircraft to know conventional lighting on them. So it's a, it's a strange case for sure, and I'm getting cases like this on a regular basis of very peculiar, uh, bizarre lights maneuvering in a fashion that seems to be uncharacteristic of any kind of terrestrial aircraft. So, Peter, did he give you an idea of what the duration of that sighting was? I can tell you in a moment. Uh, 20 seconds. 20 seconds, okay. And that's another, thank you for mentioning that, Mark. Uh, that's another uh, indicator that it was not a satellite. Satellites usually travel at about one degree per second across the night sky. And to go 
a large distance across the night sky in 20 seconds suggests that its angular velocity was higher than that of a typical, even a low Earth satellite, low Earth orbit satellite. So we just posted new reports to our website on Thursday of this past week. And there are a lot of reports like this, seemingly unexplained, bizarre acting lights. And we have no idea what they are. Let's uh, also tell people, might as well do it at this point too, where they can find the National UFO Reporting Center on the Internet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. Uh, we have a website. The website for the National UFO Reporting Center is www.ufocenter.com. U-F-O-C-E-N-T-E-R. We spell it strangely down here in the colonies. <laughs> uh, I I stipulate that spelling for the benefit of our many Canadian listeners. UFOcenter.com. And on that website, we have now about uh, almost 100,000 reports posted. Half of what I've collected over the last uh, 26 years as director of the center will have the other half posted in the very near future. But uh, we also have an online report form that they can just fill out. And on that point, I'd like to emphasize, uh, people are always asking me whether we're interested in past sighting reports, and we are very interested in them. I might share one later in this program that is a prime example of how important it is to share past sighting reports. But uh, we it doesn't matter to us whether it was uh, six decades or six minutes ago, we're very interested in what people have to report if they think they saw a UFO. And it's always fascinating. It's always fascinating for people to go there and uh, actually plug in their own hometown and find out what's been going on in their neck of the woods they didn't even know about. So that's kind of fun, yeah. too. And I'll share an observation I've had for 26 years is doing this crazy job. Uh, people will often call the hotline, which is area code 206-722-3000, wanting to report their recent sighting. And frequently, almost probably in more than half the cases, they will aver that they happen to know that their particular little dwarf or village, it happens to be a hotspot of UFO activity happens all the time. They, they believe that uh, their particular location on the planet is a hot spot for UFO activity. And what it tells us, I think all of these people may be correct, but what it tells us is that there are a lot of UFO report sightings that people do not report formally. And uh, hence my appeal for people to submit past sighting reports from decades past, years or decades past. So yeah. most people think their their particular location on the planet happens to be a hot spot for UFO activity. Interesting. Well, I'd like to share another report. I see our time is running out. Uh, this is a more recent report. This is from yesterday, last evening, the 8th of August, 2020, 2230 hours, 10.30 p.m. in Wendover, Utah. I appear to be addressing the issue of lights, and this is another, another case of mysterious lights. A gentleman writes that he and a friend were out camping west of Bonneville Salt Flats in Utah. He says they're about eight miles west of Bonneville, up in the mountains. They had beautiful conditions for viewing the night sky. And one of them became aware of a strobing light in the night sky. It would strobe one, two, three, and then it would stop. Then it would strobe one, two, three, and stop. He's adamant on that point. 
and they lay there for an hour and a half looking at that object with binoculars. Well, ordinarily I would be suspicious of a twinkling star, except the object was not moving together with the star field. They could tell that it was staying absolutely motionless in the sky relative to the movement of the stars, which of course is caused as the Earth rotates to the east. The stars appear to move to the west generally. So he awakened at 2 o'clock in the morning, two hours after they had last spotted it, and to his great amazement, the object was still there. And he could see it, albeit not terribly clearly with uh, his naked eyes. Uh, they could barely make it out, but it was strobing distinctly strobing, when they put binoculars on it, the effect was quite pronounced. They were convinced that they had seen a UFO. And I myself, Michael, have seen something very similar to that up near, uh, on the west side of the Puget Sound in near Seattle. I can think I can tell you the date. It was the 23rd of June, 1983. I saw something very strange. It took 40 minutes for a strobing object to move across the night sky. I have no idea what I saw, but there are some strange things that take place, I think, in our night skies that probably generally do not go or not detected. Wow, you know, that... Uh, is kind of uh, interesting in the fact that you're saying that it strobed three times uh, and stopped repeatedly. I mean, that's almost like a Morse code uh, uh, cry for an SOS is what I'm thinking, yeah. you know. I don't, I don't know if it would correspond to that, but uh, that is very interesting. And it didn't, uh, it seemed to not move in relative uh, um Rotation to the other nighttime stars. That's also strange. And the fact that it was around for so long. Oh, boy, that's very interesting. Yeah, it didn't move relative to the people who were viewing it. Whereas the stars did seem to move across. Well, didn't seem. They did. They moved across the sky as the Earth rotated to the east. Yeah. So there, there are a lot of interesting reports coming in. And I'm... I think I'm, if I sound a little helter-skelter tonight, it's because I'm being inundated with reports and can't, can't handle them as I used to be able to. Um, I'm just being inundated with good reports like the ones I've shared tonight. And, uh, yeah. Well, it's it's got to be hard to keep up with. Uh, you've, you've told me that uh, ever since this, uh, kind of like worldwide lockdown here uh, that we're operating under. People seem to have a lot more time in their hands. I don't know if that's the the, the deal, but the reports have come in uh, to the National UFO Reporting Center in droves comparatively to the past. So you, you've got to be doing uh, whatever you can to keep up with that. We just thank you again for all the decades, literally, of hard work that you've put into this thing. If you call the National UFO Reporting Center at 206-722-3000, you're more than likely to get Peter Davenport on the phone. That's the amazing part of it. So thank you for all your hard work. Well, thanks for your comments. Nice, flattering comments. It's a lot of hard work, but I think it's very important work. If, after all, if we're being visited by strange craft and presumed creatures in those craft. I think that's a very important bit of information that the resident, residents of this planet should have access to. Well, especially when uh, just recently the New York Times now is confirming that the federal government and the military are in possession of craft not of this world. Let's put it that way. I mean, things are really starting to heat up here. And I can't imagine what's going to be coming down the, the road here uh, as far as any announcements that might be happening soon. But before we let you go, Peter, let's make sure that people have that uh, mailing address. Uh, if they're so inclined to send you a five ten dollars check or whatever to help defray some of your costs after all these years, 
Uh, let's find out where we can send that to you. Well, thank you, and I should preface by saying none of that money goes to salary. I've done this for 26 years for no salary. But uh, they'd like to send us a small amount. They can mail it to the National UFO Reporting Center, P.O. Box 700, Davenport, Washington, like my name, Davenport, Washington, 99122. And thank you for allowing me to do that. Oh, it's our pleasure, Peter. Uh, I really uh, appreciate you coming on the show here and uh, letting me introduce you to uh, David, to Mark, uh, to Wizziak, and uh, to uh, allow us to have these exciting reports again. We'll probably check in with you next week, and hopefully there'll be some interesting stuff happening again. So uh, we're going to take our break here, you guys, at the bottom of the hour, and we'll be back in about six minutes. So uh, don't go away, folks. We'll be right back with Spaced Out Radio. Hey, Spaced Spaced Out Out Radio Radio fans. fans. It's It's John John Resnick, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to ChiveCharities.org and become a donor today. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning Bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience is proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. For more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Are you addicted to the woo? Good, me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. 
From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything, Everything on the menu starts, starts at just 6 dollars Who serves food, food that, that cheap anymore? anymore? At the, at the Moose, Moose, you'll, you'll never, never know who you'll run, run into. into. Rock, Rock stars, stars, actors, actors athletes. athletes. It's the place everyone, everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Welcome back, folks, to Spaced Out Sunday. I am Michael W. Hall, your host for tonight. And um, Mark DeWisiak was born in Huntington, New York on September 7th, 1956. He is a graduate from Harvard, Harbor Fields High School, class of 1974. And he's a journalism graduate of George Washington University. He has worked on theater, film, and television as a theater, film, and television critic since 1979. He started his journalism career in Washington, D.C. bureaus of Knight Ritter newspapers and the Associated Press. In 1983, after stints as the arts and entertainment editor at Bristol Harrier uh, Bristol Herald Courier in Bristol, Virginia, and Kingsport Times in the Kingsport, Tennessee, he moved to the Akron Beacon Journal in Akron, Ohio, as the newspaper's TV critic, later becoming its film critic and critic at large. He has also been a television critic for The Plain Dealer in Cleveland, Ohio, since 1999. A member of the Television Critics Association Board of Directors, he has won five Cleveland Press Club Awards for entertainment writing, as well as the Society of Professional Journalists Award for coverage of minority issues. Mark has edited three collections of works by the famous Twilight Zone, Somewhere in Time, and Kolchak writer Richard Matheson all published by Gauntlet Press. Richard Matheson's Kolchak Scripts, Kolchak Scripts, uh, Bloodlines, Richard Matheson's Dracula, I Am Legend, and Other Vampire Stories, and Richard Matheson's Censored and Unproduced I Am Legend screenplay. Mark met his wife, actress Sarah Shulman, uh, on the performance stage. In 2002, they founded the Largely Literary Theater Company, a touring troupe dedicated to promoting literacy, literature, and live theater. As the company's artistic director, Mark frequently appears in the large, uh, Largely Literary Productions as Mark Twain and Charles Dickens, 
He currently teaches as an adjunct professor at Kent State University, in addition to writing for The Plain Dealer. And each semester since the spring of 2009, he has taught the reviewing film and television and vampires in film and television courses. He frequently lectures and gives talks on Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, television and vampires, and lives in Cayuga Falls, Ohio, with his wife, Sarah, and their daughter, Becky. I, uh, M- Mark, I hope I didn't embarrass you by reading all of that, but I'll tell you what, I didn't want to miss one little thing there in that bio of yours. Well, no, I appreciate it. I, I should update that, though. Uh, a 43-year journalism career came to an end in early April uh, when uh, there was a, a huge... Uh, layoff at the uh, the plain dealer, and I was included in that. So um, I had a 43 year run, most of it as a theater, film, and or TV critic. So uh, no complaints, no regrets. It was a it was a fantastic run. If you spend 43 years uh, getting paid to to go to the movies or watch television, you don't get to complain about it uh, when it's all over. So um, yeah, know, it, it again. Um, it, it was really a fantastic run, but uh, I, I am in the uh, uh, now uh, full-time book writer business. So uh, that's that's what I'm doing. And it's kind of nice because between 1982, I, I, my first book was published in 1982. And, you know, the, when you look the way we do, Michael, you know, your bones creak a little bit when you say that out loud. When you <laughs> sort of, uh, put a date on it. But, you know, when I finished my first book, I, I was working for a newspaper in um, – the, the Kingsport paper in Tennessee. And I sort of said to myself that that was so tough to write a book while working full time at, at a newspaper because, you know, uh, you have to do it in your spare moments. You have to do it at night and weekends. You have to steal time yeah, in order to write a book that way. And as I always say to people, you know, if, if you're a bodybuilder, if that's what you do for a living, you don't go to the gym at the end of the day to relax like the rest of us do. Those muscles are tired at the end of the day. And that's the same thing with writing. It's hard to write a, a postcard at the end of the day if that's what you've been doing all day. So when I got through that first book, I, I made a promise to myself, which was that I would never do another book the same way again. And, of course, I've done 25 of them the same way uh, yeah. since then. So now it's, it's kind of nice to be able to, uh, at my age, which is 63 going on 64, and I never hide my age. I'm very proud of you know, every gray hair that, that's up there, it has certainly shortened the time it takes me to portray Mark Twain, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, uh, definitely. I, I first started playing Mark Twain when I was 22 years old. Is that and right? When I was 22 years old, Michael, it took me two hours to look like this. Right. So, you know, it's, I was actually showing myself what I was going to look like when I was 63, when I was 22. So, uh, you know, but um, it's kind of nice now just to be... Uh, writing books full time and uh not having to worry about the day job all the time so oh i can i can commiserate with that i mean i can't imagine you know i uh being a lawyer uh for uh well over three decades myself and uh, i've got you know four novels and 15 short stories up on amazon i like to write that's always something i've ever done but um you know uh Lawyers do a lot of writing as well, not as much as you did as a critic when you're doing an eight hour gig of writing, you know, as a job. I mean, that I can't imagine uh, then having the gumption to go home and get into the zone. Uh, by the way, I love the zone that you're portraying right now in your attic uh, uh, writing space. Uh, but uh, that would have been difficult to actually make that transition, especially if for some reason, uh, you are not the evening writer. You know how people have certain times during the day they feel comfortable getting into that zone. I don't know what your comfort zone was to get into the ability to do that. That's one thing that worked in my favor. I am a creature of the night. I, I do sort of get more. I'm not a morning person by any means, so I get more alert. You're lucky you're getting. I mean, right now it's, it's, it's you know, it, it's 1248 here in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, and uh, I, I'm fairly alert, and this is kind <laughs> of my prime time. Uh, so, I mean, but, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that about lawyers writing. Um, you know, my so my resume, and we'll probably get into this, but I have a deeply schizophrenic writing resume. 
you know, a good deal of it, uh, and some of the things you're going to want to talk about fall onto what we would call the spooky side of the street. Um, and that's definitely a big part of the resume. But there's another part of the resume. It's all, it's all scattered. I mean, five of my books are on Mark Twain. Um, and my very first book on Mark Twain, which was published by St. Martin's in 1996, was called Mark My Words, Mark Twain on Writing. And it was basically the handbook, the writing handbook that Mark Twain never really wrote, but he left behind a, a writing handbook in all the letters, the essays, even in the novels. He was constantly talking about writing. He was constantly discussing writing. So, you know, my job was to extract all of that and put it into book form and put it. And so I published this book called Mark Twain on Writing. And it got reviewed by several law journals. Is that and right? Really amazed, but every law journal said the same thing, which was what Mark Twain has to say about writing can help lawyers in, in what they have to write because his rules are all wonderful for lawyers trying to communicate. Uh, so I actually, I got some very good reviews from, from legal journals of all things. Oh, that's so, wonderful. That, that is quite high praise. If you can get any kind of positive <laughs> review from a legal journal. Oh my goodness. I, I, at first I thought that was weird, you know, cause you know, you sort of expect various, uh, reviews from their various places, but then you start to see a couple from legal journals. You're like, what is this all about? Yeah. There are people basically saying, you know, Mark Twain has a lot to teach us as lawyers on Oh. How to effectively communicate. You know, one of the things Mark Twain once said was um, that the, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. And, <laughs> you know, and they said, you know, that that's very important when how precise you have to be in language, which is legal, that you can't use the almost right word. You have to use the right word. Uh, you know, he also said, don't use, you know, you always use the right word. Don't use the second cousin to the word. Use the word, the precise word that you wanted to use. Oh. So, you know, he, he was a, a, a meticulous craftsman as a writer. And that's what I think they were talking about was that, you know, clarity is important in, uh, yeah. in, in communication. Oh, that's wonderful to hear, uh, by the way, because, you know, I've always, I mean, after, I mean, even if you're not a good writer and you become a lawyer, you end up being a pretty decent writer eventually because what you have to realize is that when you're writing something for a trier of fact, like the, the judge or a jury to hear, um, you have to realize that the, they have very little time to discern what you're trying to tell them. It's not like you can be very verbo verbose. You know, you can't be very confusing. You've got to be pretty, pretty plain in your language and, like you said, very crisp and discerning on how you describe things because there just is not enough time in the world uh, to browbeat people, you know, with uh, with prose. So I can imagine Mark Twain, Mark Twain being a, a really good lawyer at one point if he wanted to. Uh, of course, he's written many, many of those kind of ideas where there were courtroom scenes and that kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, I just really enjoy uh, the way he writes. That's fascinating stuff. I remember the one big quote I always remember about Mark Twain as well. He says, um, and I, you probably know this better than I do, um, uh, don't pick a fight with someone who orders their ink by uh, train car loads. Yeah, by the cargo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, where, where they could just, they could just out, out, uh, verbose you out uh right. you know at any time that they want you know the newspapers uh in that regard and i thought that was hilarious you got to pick and choose your fights yes yes but uh twain never lets you down it always sounds like he's talking about today he's one of the few writers who talks in a language that's that you you read other writers around the same time uh, from the 19th century and it sounds like they're talking in a different language that they're writing in a different language and twain sort of speaks to us in a plain american english that um, seems as fresh today. And it also, he, he understood that human nature doesn't change. Yeah. So his observations on, on human nature always seem... I, it's why he is the most quoted uh, writer uh, by far. But I mean, more than Shakespeare, Mark Twain is quoted in columns and in, in speeches and in, in other books. Um, he is forever being cited um, and, and quoted. We love trotting out the 
the founding fathers, those poor old founding fathers, to uh, make our arguments, but very few people have actually read the founding fathers or can really quote anything they ever wrote or said. <laughs> but Mark Twain, you know, is, is, is he always seems to have a, a maxim ready for the moment. Yes, and, and, and actually those maxims seem to be so witty and uh, go right to the heart of the matter that uh, you don't have to wonder what he's trying to tell you. I always just love the way he was so plain and clear in his statements. Well, and again, that goes back to the, 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 the legal uh, aspects of all this, which you're talking about what's good to, when presenting something to a judge or a jury. And Mark Twain once said that... Um, Plain clarity is better than ornate obscurity. <laughs> and he said, you know, I never write Metropolis because I can get the same price for City. <laughs> you know? Oh, I never my. I policeman because I can get the same price for Cop. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But, you know, he was also saying, you know, this is a language we all understand. Yeah. And uh, he hated when somebody got out of what he called, you know, a ruler and slicked up his language for it. Because, you know, he said, you know, if I wanted it to sound like that, I would have. You well, know? and you get the feeling that many of his contemporaries at the time were trying to impress people with their vocabulary, where he he just did not go that direction. A lot of writers back then wrote for each other. They wrote for an academic standard. There was a, um, a stranglehold on... Uh, what was acceptable literature in from the New England school, and Twain stood against all of that. He wrote under the vernacular. He created boy heroes who spoke as boys spoke. Uh, you know, there's a reason that um, William Dean Howells called him the Lincoln of our literature, is that, you know, that he set the literature free because he allowed people to address a wide degree of subjects and a wide degree of... And in his lifetime, he was never considered the great American writer. He was, you know... There, there were always polls every year when Mark Twain was alive uh, where they would poll critics and academics and other writers, and they would ask them to name the 10 greatest American writers of that time. And Twain, towards the end of his life, started to come in at around number 10, you know. Uh, and the, the nine people who were ahead of him you'd never heard of today. <laughs> They're all gone. I mean, it's like, you know, I go, who is ahead of him? You know, you don't know, you don't care. You know, and yeah. Mark Twain, you know, he's like begrudgingly, he just started to make the list at the end of his life. And even then, it took another 20 years before academia said, well, maybe he's OK to teach. Maybe he's OK to yeah. get in the door. You know, but it was a long haul. <laughs> you know, this this is a, a major stretch, I know, uh, to any kind of a, a comparison. But I, I really kind of compare Mark Twain to... Um, a more contemporary uh, guy like Hunter S. Thompson. Uh, well, not, I don't think that's a stretch at all. You know, I, I, I don't think that that's a stretch in, in the least little bit. I think Hunter S. Thompson would have told you he was, you know, certainly influenced by the freedom and the irreverence of Mark Twain. And the, the, the Mark Twain was, you know, the, sort of the founder of American realism. Yeah. Uh, you know, the idea of making it real. And, you know, his descendants are, you know, it goes right on through because you know the next into the night in the next century, Hemingway and Steinbeck are going to be you know really of that school, and then the next generation beyond that. Uh, and Hunter S. Thompson as a uh, an observer of the American scene and a humorist. I mean, Hunter S. Thompson is very funny. <laughs> yeah, uh, as that, well. That's uh, what I that's what I enjoy as well. The yeah. uh, and the an outlandish uh, character like Mark Twain, he built a character. Yes. You know, there yeah. is, you know, this, this 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 character that we know as Hunter S. Thompson, just as Samuel Clemens built this character we know of as Mark Twain. Um, and and I so you know, I think they had a lot in common, quite quite frankly. And I think it, Hunter S. Thompson is one of many spiritual descendants of Mark Twain. I think everybody's got a little bit of Mark Twain. You know, George Carlin had a little bit of Mark Twain. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, oh yeah. I think a lot of people did, you know. So uh, everybody's got a little bit you know, of that. Thank goodness. Thank goodness. That's funny. You mentioned uh, George Carlin. I, I have a childhood story that I love to tell. Um, I literally grew up on man in Manhattan uh, in the fifties and the sixties and my next door neighbor, the tenement building next to mine on West 121st street, uh, George Carlin grew up with his mother in an apartment there. He was about seven years older than I was. So he was like, 
you know, the big kids on the block that we stayed away from, his gang. But uh, literally, I grew up next door to George Carlin. And now that that, that was the, the, that point when the New York neighborhoods were changing to like when West Side Story. Yeah. You know, was they said, well, the West Side, that's why, you know, it was set on the West Side. A, and then a little while later, the West Side wasn't so bad. It was more the East Side that got bad by the time, you know, West Side Story became such a big hit. Yeah. It's yeah. The nature of New York neighborhoods. Uh, well, our, our little section of uh, Morningside Park. Uh, yeah. Between Amsterdam Avenue and Broadway on 100, 100, West 125th Street, George Carlin coined the term White Harlem back right. then in the old days. And I don't know if you've seen his routines this his time. Routines. He did it. He, he mentioned White Harlem in his stand up routines, you know, uh, because he and his because he said Morningside Park sounded uh, just too gentle as it compared to Harlem. Yeah, you, know, you got it. Harlem. It just sounds so safe and sweet you know so a white car that sounds good <laughs> so, oh we had yeah. of course we had you know we had deep harlem at 125th street and we had spanish harlem you know right right by that and then, of course white harlem was you know you know right next to columbia university but anyway yeah. um oh my and then of course uh when i was uh about 27 years old literally i got the work for george carlin as the host in the dressing room at Universal Studios Amphitheater, backstage at uh, Universal Studios. And, oh, my goodness, was that a come around, uh, you know, whole idea. And I remember telling uh, uh, George that, uh, you know, I totally um, uh, he was one of my God idols as a kid because we grew up next to each other. We had quite a camaraderie going back on that because he was way famous. And and uh, but I, I got to be his gopher for about uh, two or three weeks every year when he come through and do shows. So that was fun. I got to do an interview with him. Um, he, he, he did a show in Akron. Um, oh, I don't know, maybe about 10 years before he died. And uh, he was coming in to do the show and uh, they, they asked me to do an interview with him. And, you know, he of course I said yes. And um, like a lot of comedians, he was so different than his state. He was one of the most thoughtful Yes. Respectful. It was a real conversation. Like we're having right now, it was a genuine conversation. He was not pushing. He was not trying to be on. He was really seriously wanted to talk about uh, the craft of comedy, uh, his biography, his background, his thoughts on politics and where we were heading. And it was, a, it, was a, it was really a wonderful conversation. You don't always get that with comedians. You don't always... Yes. Uh, get that kind of level of thoughtfulness. You, um, you're right. You're, you're right, uh, Mark, because especially with comedians, there is a lot of pain there. I mean, I don't oh, know if you've heard that, you know, the, the whole theory of, of comedy comes from pain. And I'll tell you what, these guys have so many defense mechanisms that they throw up in most cases uh, that uh, it's very unusual to get a guy like George Carlin who's able to, you know, put his defenses down and really sit there and be with you. You know, uh, over the, the year, during 43 years of, of the journalism career, I got to interview a lot of comedians. And a lot of them got to, I, I did a couple of stints of st doing stand up comedy in my disreputable past. All right. I had a comedy partner in Virginia, Tennessee that I worked with, uh, who is now the official uh, Barney Fife impersonator. His name is David Browning. If you look him up, the Mayberry deputy, he, whenever we work together, people would say he looked exactly like Don Knotts. And oh, he cool. Would give it the quick, yeah, and uh, people would laugh, and you know, we'd go on. But he turned that into a full career. It, it, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, it's still one of my best friends. Yeah. Um, so, you know, comedians kind of tended to warm up to me a bit because um, I had done some time in the trenches, so to speak. Um, and I also, over the same period of time, got to interview a lot of people who were in the horror field um yeah almost all of the leading horror writers of that era stephen king clive barker Anne rice uh whitley streber wow um you you know you name it uh, and then some of the like robert block and ray bradbury and harlan ellison so I, I you know a lot of them i got to know very well and uh the one common theme i found was this the horror people were all sweethearts 
without exception, just down to earth, wonderful people. Wow. The comedians were the monsters. Yeah. The comedians were, you know, not all. I mean, look, you know, Bob Newhart, right up to everybody's idea that he's one of the, he is one of the nicest people you'd ever want to meet. Wow. But I think the reason is, and, and Stephen King told me this um, during one of the several interviews, uh, King said that we get rid of our pain. We work through all of the nightmares. Yeah, and yeah. We write it down. It's cathartic. We put it down on paper, and then we give it to you. We get rid of it. The comedians hold on to their pain. In order to remain funny and have that edge, they have to be in touch with that pain. And they have to. They can't get rid of it. If you get rid of it, you lose something. Yeah. That's a weird way to live when you stop to think about it, when you really kind of stop to think about it. So I think there's kind of a reason for it. But um, I, without exception, I remember saying that to Robert Block, who wrote Psycho, uh, mentioning this theory to him and saying, you know, that I said, you know, the horror people are, 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 are nicer. And Block looked at me and said, yeah, we're funnier, too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very, very well said. Oh, gosh, this is great. Mark, we're going to take a break here at the bottom of our hour here, by the way. Uh, just so you know, we've got six whole minutes. You can relax and enjoy <laughs> And we will be right back on no, Spaced Out walk. Sunday. Thank you. Yeah, we'll be right back. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit Bumble, f- we're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot Hot Sauce, available now at kajons.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from, and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the store you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. 
We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Hi, this is Amber Beckrud, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. Hey, space travelers, this is John Resig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just 5 bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, the paranormal lawyer, Michael W. Hall. Thanks for joining me tonight. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates, WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia, and UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. And on the digital side, we are very proud to be on Revolution Radio. And don't forget, you can always check our archives for free at any time you want at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do me a favor, just hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping at our spaced out radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. And we are back with Mark DeWidziak right now, and we're talking about all sorts of interesting uh, journalistic and uh, uh, criticism and uh, performance issues that Mark has uh, been involved with for literally over four decades here. And Mark, I wanted to ask you, you know, it's very interesting that you've got this journalistic background, this uh, writing background, but you're also a performer as well, and sounds like from a very early age. Well, I'd be careful about that. <laughs> uh -huh. I'd be careful about that. I'm not really an actor. I mean, I, I, I play one on stage, but I'm not really... Uh, my wife, is Sarah, 
Sarah Showman is a trained, that's a real name, by the way. Everybody thinks that's a stage name, but it's not. Yeah. Um, Sarah is the real uh, actor in the family. She, she's trained in, and she has a wide repertoire. Uh, she can do anything. Um, we, when we started the theater company, uh, we started it on a, uh, with a three, ver- char- three actor version of A Christmas Carol. Uh, adaptation that I uh, I wrote. Oh wow! And it's faithful to Charles Dickens' language as possible, and the conceit of the the play as we staged it was that the audience was there to hear Dickens uh, read the Christmas Carol, which he did. He loved reading it to audiences. So I would uh, come out as Dickens with the full door knocker beard and everything, and uh, start reading the story. And then it was as if the story was coming to life around me. So another actor would come on playing Scrooge. Uh, as I talked about Scrooge, uh, grasping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And <laughs> then he would, uh, you know, and then Sarah, my wife, would play everybody else. Oh, my. Oh, he'd go off as one character. Come on, men, women, children, ghosts, mortals, immortals, a uh, whole schmear. And, and the reason I knew we could do it was because of what a wonderful uh, actress Sarah is. I am sort of like, you know, the Johnny Cash of actors. I have like two notes that I can do, that I, that I exist between. <laughs> and you know, so I tend to play parts which are very close to my own personality or my own uh, experience. I, I play writers. I play, you know, so I play Dickens. I play Twain. I've been playing Mark Twain for 40 years on stage. But that really comes out of the writing. I don't really think that's a real actor. You know, um, I do act and I do, you know, I want to stay so I can't deny it. And I can't deny that I've spent a lot of time on stage uh, playing roles, but the roles are almost all, um, you know, like even in, in, in uh, regular productions. In Inherit the Win, I played the Hornbeck character, who's based on H.L. Mencken. Uh, in The Good Doctor, which was the show I met Sarah doing in 1981, I was playing the Anton Chekhov character. And there's a common theme here. You know, I keep, you know, it's in my contract that I play writers. Yeah, uh, and I guess that's because you know I understand that, and it's not alien to my nature. But real acting, true acting, is the ability to create a character that is alien to your nature, and making it believable. And I don't have that ability, so it's like when somebody calls says that you're you're a professor at a school. Part of me, you know, rebels at that too because I feel a little bit phony about it. Because I'm an adjunct, I have a lonely, lowly bachelor's degree from George Washington. Um, they let me in, and you know, and, or, or the other one that is like you're a Mark Twain scholar. I'm kind of half-assed Mark Twain scholar. You know, they, they, they. I do academic papers at, at conferences. Five of my books are in Mark Twain. Uh, I study him relentlessly. Um, but you know, they let me in the side door to do that. I mean, they don't let me in the front door. I have to come in, but they let me in. And it's the same thing with teaching. They, they let me in to play professor and teach my classes. And even they come off of the writing is because you know, I started by teaching a writing class at Kent State, and I adore that. So you know, it all goes back to the writing with me. It all goes goes back to that. But I don't like to overstate my you know uh, ability or and, and I don't, because I don't think you can overstate the lack of ability as an actor. Um, you know, I I think I've become pretty good playing Mark Twain. And and by the way, I always say this to, to anybody who's listening and those who aren't. Um, that I would not step foot on stage as Mark Twain without uh, Hal Holbrook's uh, permission and, and blessing. You know, he's been a dear friend since the 1980s, um, and he showed us all how to do it. Oh my! He I was I, I was and, just going to ask you uh, if you had uh, you know any kind of uh, pointers from a Hal Holbrook, you know, in doing this. And it sounds like you actually know the gentleman. Well, oh yeah, we've we've been like I say very close, uh, and, um, and 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 I've talked to him a lot. I have hours upon hours of, of of discussion and conversation on tape discussing Mark Twain and playing Mark Twain. Uh, we've just it's an on, been an ongoing conversation. Now Hal is ninety five. Wow. And he hung up the white suit a couple of years ago, but when at some point he did, he'd been playing Mark Twain for sixty three years. Are you kidding? Show. Yeah. Now, that's not only 63 years, but Michael, that's 63 years in an ever-changing show. He would toss out stuff, put new stuff in to reflect the times. Oh, wow. And by the time he quit, he figured he had gone through about 18 hours of material. 
Yeah. Now, I have six hours of material dedicated to memory of Mark Twain. I'm a piker compared to what Hal had committed to memory. And uh, not only that, I mean, think about this. Just think about this for a second. Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens became Mark Twain when he adopted the pen name in the Nevada Territory in 1863. He died in 1910. Okay, so for those of you keeping score at home, um, that's I think 47 years. Uh, is that right? Wow. Um, whatever it is, that's 47 years. How started in 1954 doing his one show a couple of years ago, which means Hal Holbrook was Mark Twain longer than Mark Twain was Mark Twain. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, you know, he, he, but when I say he showed us how to do it, it's, it's simply this. Do you know, we do not have any recordings of Mark Twain's voice. Oh, no, I didn't know didn't, that. Now, it isn't that he didn't make them. Twain was fascinating with technology. He was fascinated with, he was, he was quick to use a typewriter. He was quick to, you know, have the Kodak camera around him. Uh, he loved gadgets and such. So people say, well, didn't he make any recordings? Of course, he made recordings all the time. They all went up in an Edison fire, a warehouse fire, in around 1915, 1916. And ever since then, we have no authenticated recording of, of Mark Twain's voice. That doesn't mean we won't find one. Yeah. It doesn't mean somebody won't open a trunk one day and find a wax cylinder. Yeah. And there will be Twain's voice. It better be stored in a basement, by the way, and not an attic. Because it's got to be in a better be in a cool place, yeah. And to be able to, have, and then you better have a device capable of playing it, right? But um, <clears throat> but the point is that um, we have recordings of everybody's voice around Mark Twain, everybody: Theodore Roosevelt, Booker T. Washington, William Jennings Bryan, all the people Twain knew. If you were of any celebrity, you recorded your voice, and we have little snatches of what everybody sounded like from that period. Twain, it, there, there's none. But Hal Holbrook started putting together his depiction of Mark Twain uh, in 1954 when there were a lot of people around who knew Twain, and including Twain's daughter, Clara, including Twain's private secretary, Isabel Lyon, including the son of Twain's lecture manager, Bim Pond. They helped him get the voice and the mannerisms right, which means the only reason we think we know what Mark Twain sounded like is because of Hal Holbrook. He is a living piece of Mark Twain's scholarship. So when people say to me, you know, and I, often enough, there, there are a lot of people who portray Mark Twain, and people will say to me, you know, oh, you know, I play Mark Twain. And I, uh, they say, you know, I put together my own portrayal. I said, well, how did you do that? How did you do that exactly? I'm curious. I'm curious. You know, how did you come up with the voice? You yeah. Know, how did you go? Because I'm very clear that when I do Mark Twain's voice, and I figure out what Mark Twain sounded like, I'm going very naturally on what Hal has done, because his voice is probably very close to what we think he sounded like. So Very nice. Yeah. Very, I, I will tell you right off the bat, you know, if I'm any good as Mark Twain at all when I play Mark Twain, it's because of Hal Holbrook. And that's why my, my uh, third book on Mark Twain was dedicated to Hal. You know, and it simply says, you know, to Hal Holbrook, he knows why, you know. Yeah. And that, you know, so. Wow. But, and the only, the only way I, you know, probably about five years, five or six years before he quit playing Mark Twain, we had dinner, as we often would, uh, when we were in the same place at the same time. Either he'd come to Ohio to portray Mark Twain, or I'd go to Los Angeles on business. And we were having dinner, and... Uh, I said to him, which is quite true, I said, you will always be the gold standard when it comes to playing Mark Twain. Nobody will ever be able to touch you, me included, no matter how much I work at it and no matter how much I add to it. Nobody will ever get near you. However, there are now two ways that I can beat you. And Hal sort of lifted his eye, eyebrow and said, oh, what's that? <laughs> and I said, well... The first way I can beat you is I can now get on stage faster than you can, <laughs> which 
you know, it was literally true because it doesn't take much anymore. I do a little age lines. I do a, a little bit of touching up. Yeah, yeah. Bushy up the eyebrows a bit, but it's basically put on the white suit, grab the cigar and go. I said, it still takes you two hours. You know, I'm out there performing while you're still getting into, into makeup. <laughs> you know, and he said, well, what's the other way? And I said, well, I'll do a show you won't do. Because Hal is very careful to make sure that every, he, he's always in command of every word. Because Hal's a real actor. So every time he goes out on stage, he knows exactly what he's going to do. I offer a performance of Mark Twain where I will do question and answer to Mark Twain. Oh, no. I don't know what I'm going to do. Wow. I basically go out in front of an audience and I say, because I'm familiar enough with Twain's biography, his life, um, the, and, and his material and, and his, his writing and the, the scope of his life. That um, and, and the only the only caveat, is, which is what I always say when I set up the show, is that they, you can't ask me uh, about today. You can't ask me what would Mark Twain think of Donald Trump. We don't know what Mark Twain would think. You can guess, yeah. but we don't know. And I won't speak for Mark Twain on today. So if you ask me about the president, I'm going to tell you about Theodore Roosevelt. I'll tell you what I think of him. Yeah. Uh, because we do know what he thought about Theodore Roosevelt. So um, that's the only caveat. And so I, I will do like, it's almost like Twain jazz. Yeah. Somebody will, you know, I, I can't do that with anybody. I can't, as much as I know about Dickens, I can't do that with Dickens. Dickens had 10 children. Oh my. I'm not sure I could name them all. I'm, yeah. and I'm, I'm sure if, I'm not sure I could name them all. I'm not sure I'd get the order right. Now, Dickens would know his children's names. That question alone would, would, would kill me. Yeah, you yeah. Know? But with Twain, you know, if somebody asked me about his children or, or whatever, and again, I know enough to, to ad lib, and it's fun. But, but as soon as I said that, Twain, uh, Hal sort of shook his head and said, you're right, I'd never do that. Uh, I'll bet. Oh, my. <laughs> Well, and and that brings up the question then: uh, what what would uh, today's audiences uh, ask you about Mark Twain uh, in those kinds of question and answer sessions? Do you have some popular questions that you get uh, fielded? Oh, sure. And you know, and, and here's the trick: often enough, they'll ask me questions which will trigger material I either perform as Mark Twain or know as Mark. So somebody will ask me about smoking cigars. Well, you know, Twain often talked about cigars, you know, so I can, as soon as they say, you know, uh, uh, you know, ask me about the cigar, you know, I can immediately say something like, you know, uh, well, you know, I make it a rule never to smoke more than one cigar at a time. <laughs> I make it a rule never to smoke when asleep. <laughs> other than that i have no other restrictions <laughs> and uh you know then i can there's the whole he talked about cigars a lot you yeah know? And so there's a lot of that's up there so as soon as somebody says that you know uh and, and i can give them twain's actual words often enough they'll they they've got a hint about um twain was widely traveled for instance you know so wherever I might be, somebody might say, Mr. Twain, have you ever been here before? That is a good chance he was because he, he was incredibly well-traveled. Yeah. Uh, there were parts of the country he did not get to, but there were a lot of them that he did. So somebody will say, you know, uh, well, Mr. Twain, have you ever been in Cleveland before? Oh, yes, many times. One of my favorite cities. And then, I'll, you know, that will launch into uh, a, a thing about that. They also know that he had friendships with various other famous people so you almost always get a ulysses s grant question ah didn't didn't you know ulysses s grant you know and there's a lot of very funny material with that and profound and material because he helped save grant's family at the end oh uh, that, i heard about that yeah yeah well he, he grant was um the victim of like a lot of famous people he was the victim of unscrupulous and dishonest uh business managers and you know he thought he was set for life after his presidency he thought you know he and his family were set for life and what he found out was he had no money at all they had completely ripped him off yeah and he was left you know near penniless and the only way to recoup the loss at the end was to accept one of the many offers he was getting to write his memoirs 
Yes. And uh, he went to Twain and said, you know, I'm getting all these offers. Uh, I need to do something. And you have to also realize this was at the pretty much the same time Grant was diagnosed with throat cancer. Yeah. Which is a death sentence. So he's not only got to write his memoirs, he's got to write them against an actual deadline. Right. And he went to Twain and said, uh, you know, what do you think of these offers? And Twain looked at them and said, General, they're insulting. Let me publish them. Yeah. Give me the, but I will give you the most generous terms possible. And, he, you know, he, he encourages. And Grant, it's heroic. Grant, with days left in his life, he finishes the memoir. Just, you know, literally days before his death, he finishes the memoirs and he knows he's done it. This is going to lift his family out of poverty. And one year later, M Mark Twain hands Julia Dent Grant, Grant's widow, the largest single royalty check in history up to that time. Oh, my. And it does indeed lift the Grant family right out of poverty. So... You know, now you can tell that story as Mark Twain. You know, if somebody asks you about Grant, you can tell that story. Yeah. Wow. What a what a magnanimous uh, statement that was for a guy like uh, Mark Twain to do that for quite a I mean, what a what a hero, you know, not a, not just a war hero as well. But, uh, you know, a hero of uh, the politics of our times and, uh, you know, keeping the country together and all that kind of stuff, you know, I, I can't imagine. Can you imagine taking over uh, from, uh, you know, from an administration that was so torn apart during the Civil War and uh, right after Lincoln was assassinated? I mean, what in a tumultuous time to be president of the United States. Yeah. And, and Grant, you know, I mean, he's, he's a simple guy. He's a guy from Southern Ohio. You know, he comes from a very, uh, you know, blue collar background. At that time, we wouldn't have called it blue collar, but he comes from very, you know, he's, he, he really does, is the, the man who rises to the occasion, who is there at the right time. You know, and the flip side of it, by the way, is you get to do a lot of funny material with Grant, too, with, with Twain, because, um, you know, Twain, liked, he embellished, let's say, you know, and, you know, sometimes I'll explain this if I'm, if I'm talking about Twain, I'll explain this. If I'm just talking as Twain, I won't. Um, but Twain liked to say that, you know, I mean, his dream occupation was being a, a, a pilot on the Mississippi River. Uh, was a, a riverboat pilot was, you know, what he called the most unfettered and f entirely free human being who strode the earth. And he loved being a riverboat pilot. Um, but then in his words, you know, the war came and put an end to my profession. I had to find a new profession. I joined the Confederacy, trained for two weeks, deserted, and the Confederacy fell. <laughs> now, that's an embellishment. I did not join the Confederacy. It yeah. sounded romantic and it sounded good. He joined a home guard unit. Um, Missouri was a border state. Yeah. It did not go into the war on the side of the Confederacy. And in fact, the Clemens family itself was a microcosm of it. His brother, Orion, which the family pronounced Orion, um, campaigned for Lincoln. And um, but what is true is that home guard unit that, that, that he which was basically a ragtag unit of boyhood friends in, from Hannibal who went out and played soldier for two weeks. <laughs> They heard a rumor that there was a uh, a Union captain in the area with uh, a brigade of men, and they got scared and they disbanded and went home. And then Twain went west with Orion to the Nevada. Orion was rewarded for campaigning for Lincoln with the secretaryship of the Nevada Territory, and Twain went west with him as sort of a secretary to the secretary. But the captain was Ulysses S. Grant. Oh, my. So they come within a few miles of meeting each other. Yeah. <laughs> Twain's good. And Twain later, when he would give speeches where Grant was present, he would say, you know, I came within that much of ending your military career. You know, <laughs> had, we in, had we met, I undoubtedly would have gotten the best of you. Oh, my yeah. goodness. What a great story. I, I love the way you're able to go in and out of character. I know that you have to stay in character during your pr uh, productions, but... 
Uh, I really appreciate uh, you giving us little bits and tidbits here of, of the character. Yeah, every once in a while, I'll pick up the prop cigar and you know really and really do it right. <laughs> I was I was going to ask you, you. You don't have to smoke cigars all night long during your routine. Then that's good. They don't let you anymore. I mean, you know, there's there's no theater in America which would let you. As a matter of fact, I make a a, a bit of it now because everybody expects you to be holding the cigar. Yeah, you know, which, which which I do when I walk on stage. Right, and it's a real cigar, but you know, I, I, after I do about ten minutes of material, I'll say to the audience, you know, at this point, you've noticed the torpedo in my hand. Don't worry, I'm not going to ignite it. There seems to be some commandment against smoking during insurrections of this dignified nature. <laughs> so I kind of explain it. You know, why I'm holding it, but not lighting it. Yeah, yeah. So I make a bit out of it. And again, using Twain's words in oh, order my. to do it. So, uh, oh, I've, I've got to relate to you at one point. My, uh, my time with George Burns backstage in the green room at Universal Studios Amphitheater with him chain smoking cigar after cigar. Oh, boy, we're going to take a break and we're going to come right back with more of Spaced Out Radio in just a few moments, folks. So hang on to your hats. Here we go. Cold drinks, great food, and the best music in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is the place to be, open until 2 a.m. nightly. Everything on the menu starts at just $6.95. Who serves food that cheap anymore? At the Moose, you'll never know who you'll run into. Rock stars, actors, athletes, it's the place everyone wants to be. So join us at the Moose Vancouver, the Moose Vancouver, the official party bar of Spaced Out Radio. Hey, space travelers, this is John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you'd know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities, just go to chivecharities.org forward slash donate. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for something new to push your limits? Look beyond the spectrum. A new docu-series featuring some of the best researchers in the world when it comes to everything from UFOs, government cover-ups, and strange humanoids. Truth Seekers Stephen Bassett, Jeff Meldrum, Jack Kasher, and Stan Friedman, among others, all chip in to bring their knowledge to you. Beyond the Spectrum can be found on Amazon as well as Tubi TV. Tell us what you think on our Amazon page. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. At spacedoutradio.com, 
We are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello everyone, this is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Space Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Space Out Radio website and let's figure out what's going on together. Need that weekend's supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do, what to do. Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble f- Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spice it up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Okay, we are back on Spaced Out Sunday. This is Michael Libby Hall with Mark DeWidziak. We are just having a heck of a time here tonight, Mark. Thank you for uh, being up late with me tonight. I know you're uh, out there in the Midwest, and it is way early in the morning for you. Oh, but my time of the day. Uh, this is really where I am at my most alert. <laughs> so you got me actually at a good time. It's oh. a good thing this is 10 o'clock in the morning. That's a, yeah. a bad time. <laughs> yeah, I know how you feel. You got you get into a rhythm, you know, on these kinds of things. And and uh, creativity is kind of hard to uh, to push. It's got to be yeah. it's got to be something that you're comfortable with. I'm sure. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And you, you take it when you get it. So you know. And for me. It just seems the later in the day it goes, the, the the more animated I get. So, yeah, I don't know what that is, but I've always I think I've always been like that. I've always been, you know, maybe that's the part that's drawn to the spooky side. You know, maybe that's the that's that stuff. You know, maybe, maybe this is now a good time for us to get into some of the horror side of your uh, literary career uh, and some of the things that you've written as well as some of the uh, really quite famous personalities in that whole area. I don't know if you can see in my uh, wall of my law office up there, there is a life mask that's a silver color on the wall. It's hard to tell because it's so far away. But that is a life mask that I got at Universal when I was uh, a tour guide. Started out, you know, at the bottom rung, uh, you know, in... in, uh, out of college, and that's Boris Karloff, his wow. his life mask that I ended up having, and I just revere that like you wouldn't believe having the actual life mask of Boris Karloff that they used to create the um, the headpiece, you know, for the Frankenstein character sure. um, you know, at the studio there. But um, gosh, 
it's an amazing thing that you've been able to uh, literally rub shoulders with um, probably the one of the one of the well, you, you've already talked about Stephen King and, you know, those kinds of writers and stuff. But my favorite, of course, is Richard Matheson. I mean, the guy who wrote the movie Somewhere in Time, I Am Legend, you know, and uh, Kolchak and, you know, all sorts of interesting stories that uh, were very unique for their time. And uh, I'd like to hear a little bit about, you know, how you uh, were able to befriend some kind of a uh, literary figure like uh, like uh, Richard Matheson yourself. Let's see, you want the long answer or the short answer to that one? Oh, I, I, are you kidding? I would love the long answer. We got plenty of time. Right, because let me, uh, just let me, I'm going to back up just a second, but I, I, I believe me, I'll get there. Uh, I always do. Uh, because it goes kind of back to that life mask you're talking about. Oh. And because this really, for me, all starts with Universal. Yeah. Universal is hugely uh, important in all of this for me because um, I, I grew up in New York, as did you. Uh, and so you know this. You know the call letters for Channel 11 in New York, which is WPIX. Ah. Uh, all right. So yeah. They take you back to New York and WPIX. When I was growing up in New York, what they gave us for children's entertainment, uh, there was no Nickelodeon, there was no Disney Channel. So what they gave us were the comedy teams of our parents and in some cases our grandparents. We got Abbott and Costello. We got Laurel and Hardy. Uh, we got the Three Stooges. And that was my earliest influences. Uh, you know, for the first few years that where I was kind of conscious of what I was watching, I watched a fierce amount of that. Yeah, And when I'm seven years old, WPIX, dear old WPIX, showed a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Oh, now, oh what a I, classic. I love it. But Michael, I got to tell you, I was only there for the Abbott and Costello part of that title. I The only reason I was there was that this was an Abbott and Costello movie I had not seen yet. And therefore, I was there for that. Yeah. Now, when I started watching it, here comes Glenn Strange as the Frankenstein monster, Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman. And most importantly, for only the second time in his entire film career, playing on film, Count Dracula, Bela Lugosi. Because people think he played it 40 or 50 times yeah. on, on film, and he only played it twice. And that performance turned me into a horror fan. At seven years old, I was just absolutely mesmerized by this world. And I just set out to see every monster movie that I could. And I started watching The Twilight Zone. When Dark Shadows came along, I was watching that. Uh, I was getting famous monsters of film like magazine. Um, and the, the biggest influence and the most profound influence by far were the universal horror movies. If you could see up here on this shelf right here oh yeah this shelf there contains all 13 of my aurora monster models from the 1960s and the first one i got was dracula when oh. uh, for my next birthday after i saw happen and costello meet frankenstein very so nice we didn't have this term uh when i was growing up uh and the term is we now call people who grew up the way i did a monster kid you know you were a monster kid and, then, and i see you know but we didn't have that term. That term just, we, we just said, you know, you were a horror fan or you were into horror or whatever. So, you know, um, basically, what the path to Richard Matheson occurs after I was finishing my first book in 1982. It was published. Um, and that was a, a slice of theater history. It was a book about a, a regional theater called the Barter Theater which was this amazingly colorful theater in Abingdon, Virginia, which was starting during the Depression. And the whole idea was that nobody would go into the Barter Theater and pay money to get in. At the height of the Depression, starving actors from New York were taken to this little town in Abing, southwest Virginia. They put on plays. Farmers who had foodstuffs rotting in the fields that they couldn't sell because the Depression was on came into the theater, and they would barter their way in with the equivalent of foodstuffs for a ticket. 
the actors would act and the actors would eat and they would be surviving the depression. Wow. And oh, I love it. I love the that. Way the theater succeeded was, was no, the, the season was a success was at the end of the season, they would weigh the actors. <laughs> now, among the people who got their start at the Bar to Theater was Gregory Peck, Hume Cronin, Ernest Borgnine, Patricia Neal. So this, this theater produced this amazing group of people. Now, if you had asked me, Michael, at that point that that book was done, what's your next book going to be? And I say this because you can think you're hot stuff. You can think you're, you're, you're in charge. You're the captain of your ship. You're in charge of your destiny, right? You're calling the shots. Why not? You're in charge. So if you said to me, what's your next? I could say, my, I know what my next book's going to be. My next book is going to be A History of the Twilight Zone, my favorite show of all time. No question. No question at all. As a matter of fact, I'd even done enough interviews. Now, remember, I'm living in East Tennessee at this point. No part of my brain, not one, said, gee, maybe East Tennessee isn't the best place to be writing and researching a book on the Twilight Zone. You know, maybe this isn't the best headquarters for this. But I did some interviews, which actually kind of tricked myself into thinking I was going to write this. Donna Douglas, remember Ellie Mae Clampett from the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. Who was in Eye of the Beholder, one of the great Twilight Zone episodes. The oh. woman wrapped in the bandages for that, the whole episode. Oh, that's right. And they take off the bandages, and it's it's Donna Douglas. Well, I, she came to town shooting a commercial for trailers, and I ran down to the shooting site, and I interviewed her. Two of the people who were at that the Barter Theater, got to start the Barter, were in Twilight Zones, Claude Aikens and Fritz Weaver. I had interviewed them. So I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm on my way. I'm going to write this book. And then I, 1982, I walked into a bookstore in Kingsport, Tennessee, and there it was. Mark Scott Secrees, The Twilight Zone Companion, The History of the Show. And, Michael, I couldn't even get mad because Mark did such a great job on that book. It was much better than I would have ever done. It was, it, it was a landmark book about the the history of TV shows. Amazing. So, you know, but I'm a practical fellow. So I immediately shifted my sights to another favorite TV show, Columbo. Yes. And I wrote a history of Columbo called The Columbo File. I took, now, 1983, I get hired by the Akron Beacon Journal as their TV critic. And all of a sudden, I have the ideal job to research a TV show. And I spent the next five years researching and writing that book. It was published in 1989 by the Mysterious Press. And at that point, if you had asked me, what's your next book going to be? I'd say, well, I'm in charge, right? I know what my next book's going to be. It's going to be about Dashiell Hammett, the great mystery writer. Well, why do you think that's going to be your next book? Because I've got a handshake deal with the mysterious press for this to be my follow-up book. They like the idea. I like the idea. We've shook, shook hands on it. It's all sewn up. And then the stitchings came loose <laughs> because the mysterious press was owned by Warner Books. Warner Books stepped in and said, you're not a nonfiction press anymore. You're strictly a fiction press. Cut loose all your nonfiction ideas. And I was cut loose oh. with, with nowhere to go. And it was at that moment that a small publisher in New York called me and said, I love your Columbo book. Have you ever thought of doing the same type of book on the Night Stalker? And oh. I said, oh, I love the Night Stalker. I just didn't know there was a publisher crazy enough to want to do that. He said, well, I'm crazy enough to want to do it. And I said, well, hold on. Tell you what, there were four major people kind of involved there. There was uh, Darren McGavin, who played the, the Carl Kolschak character. There was Jeff Rice. The, the Las Vegas journalist who wrote the original book and created the character. There was Dan Curtis, who produced the original movie and did Dark Shadows. And there was Richard Matheson, who wrote the screenplay, adapted Jeff's book. If I can get the four of them to say yes and cooperate, I'll, I'll say yes. And um, they all said yes immediately, and that became Night Stalking, my first book about the, the Night Stalker. And that's how I got to know Richard Matheson, um, and that's how that kind of started. Now, I had met him before. I met him while he was working on a TV movie he wrote called The Dreamer of Oz about L. Frank Baum. 
And so, and I'd already knew and befriended Ray Bradbury and Harlan Ellison, who were both close friends of his. Um, but we really didn't get to know each other until I was researching the, the Night Stalker book. And then we got to be, I got closer with Richard, really, than, uh, than almost any of them. And um, I ended up writing the first Kolshak novel in 20 years, Grave Secrets, and then I ended up revising Night Stalking as the Night Stalker companion. And all during these steps, I was getting closer and closer with Richard. And then I ended up editing three volumes of work. And, um, and what this was, this was all pushing me back to the Twilight Zone. The universe was saying, you know, I said... I'm going to be the mystery guy. I wrote the Columbo book. I'm going to be the Stashel Hammett book. I'm going to be the mystery guy. But the universe stepped in and said, no, 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 no. You're a monster kid. You grew up under the spell of all those universal movies. We're going to push you back, but you're not going to see it until you're there. And then when all this was done and I had done, edited those books for Richard and I had done a book on Dracula, uh, uh, when all that was done, I started sharing the Twilight Zone with my daughter, Becky. Um, she had seen all of Night Gallery. She had seen a whole bunch of this stuff. And when she turned 15, I said, you know, you've completed your undergraduate work in classic television. <laughs> it's time to start your PhD. It's time for you to enter the Twilight Zone. So we did a forced march through all 156 episodes of the Twilight Zone. Oh, my. And after the first couple episodes, I started this running joke with her is after the episode was over, I would turn to her and shake a finger at her and say, you let that be a lesson to you, you know? And it was, we laughed, but you know, after a few, a couple weeks of this, the penny finally dropped. And I realized that's your twilight zone book. You weren't ready to write it back in 1982. This is it. You're going to extract all those life lessons and morality tales from the Twilight Zone and put them in the cover of a book. That turned into everything I need to know I learned in the Twilight Zone, and I got my Twilight Zone book. And along the way, I also got Richard Matheson. Oh. How kind is the universe? Oh, How it... good is the universe is what I'm trying to tell you. Exactly. And one of the because I was never in charge. Yes. I, you know, here I am saying, you know, like, well, you know, of course I made all the decisions. I'm the one, you know, who, who you know, but I, every time I said this is going to be my next book, I was wrong. And every time I was wrong, I was rewarded for it. So isn't that know, isn't that the way it goes? You know, you you really think that you've got a plan uh, for your your career, for your family, you know, for everything. And it's just kind of like this is what you would like to see happen. Uh, and sometimes you find it that your actual plan turns out totally different, but much better than you could ever even imagine at the time. And sometimes it's just, again, it's what going with what the, the, the universe has been planned for you. I, I remember, you know, uh, interviewing uh, Brian Dennehy, who, who just died a, a few weeks ago. Oh, why? Um, I'm glad you told me. I didn't know. Yeah, but Brian Dennehy, uh, I, at the point of, of this interview, he was had as good a career as any actor could possibly have. You know, he was doing movies like Cocoon. And, you know, he was on Broadway doing Death of a Salesman, A Long Day's Journey to Night. He was doing really prestigious television work, big, great miniseries and TV movies. And he was jumping from movies to television and to, to, to Broadway. And all of it was fantastic work. And I, and I said to him, like, how do you plan that as an actor? How do, how do you how do you, how do you plan that out? Make it. And he started laughing. And I said, "What are you laughing at?" And he said, "I'm an actor. I'm an actor. asking me what my plan is is like asking somebody falling down a flight of stairs what their plan is. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you just fall down the stairs and you end up where you end up. But I thought that's a great answer. That's a really terrific answer. Oh, and, oh, know, I love I love it. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, and to have and have the grace to be able to uh, uh, be in be present every day during that whole process too, obviously. That's right. That's right. You know, so I mean, um, and you know, the, the the universe, if you let it, can be extraordinarily kind. Um, and and one of the the great benefits of that universe was getting to know Richard. And you know, by the way, uh, he he preferred Richard. Um, 
everybody I knew and interviewed always said Dick Matheson this, Dick Matheson that. Yeah. Rod Sterling called him Dick Matheson. Dan Curtis called him Dick Matheson. And I, I thought that's too familiar. I cannot call this man Dick, you know, as a, I can so I always, and, and, and Mr. Matheson after a while seemed ridiculous. So I settled on Richard. And uh, once over lunch, he said, you know, you're one of only two people calls me Richard. My wife calls me Richard. He huh. said, you and my wife are the only two people. And I said, do you prefer? He said, yeah, I much prefer Richard. You know, that's what I prefer. Oh, is so it? I kind of settled on what he preferred by complete accident. What a great story. I, I love that. Oh, my goodness. Um, I my quick story about Richard Matheson was my, my brother uh, was a costumer for the uh, union in Hollywood, did a lot of films. He, he did uh, uh, Somewhere in Time, you know, that Richard Matheson, uh, well, they adapted from his, his book, uh, Bedtime Return. And uh, so we spent uh, the summer on Mackinac Island, 1979. Uh, I was an extra in the film. I just said, "Hey, I'm I'm, I'm going to enjoy my summer off. I'm going to uh, resign as a tour guide for that summer," and uh, literally got to hang out with uh, Christopher Reeve, Jane Seymour, Christopher Plummer, you know, my brother and the crew, and then of course Richard Richard Matheson. They actually put him in the film, you know, as a as a small part there and stuff. But just the idea that you could. Uh, be on an island, by the way, that has no cars, only horses and buggies on Mackinac Island. You know, it's just uh, literally that Victorian kind of atmosphere throughout the entire summer there while they filmed the the movie. Um, that was that was a dream come true to me. You know, the idea that you could hang out with some of these guys that were like at the top of their game at that point and just watch and listen and enjoy. You know, they were very fortunate in the sense to get uh, Mackinac Island because um, the book is actually the Coronado Hotel in San Diego. Exactly. You know, it was not supposed to be, you know, and uh, it, it was impossible to shoot there. And, but Mackinac Island, you could actually feel going back in time. It is like going back in time. Yes. Um, we're very fortunate to kind of not to get where the it was actually set. Uh, and, and by the way, you've mentioned uh, off the air when, when we were talking that uh, they literally have a somewhere in time reunion on Mackinac um, Island every October yeah. where where they literally have people come from around the world to um, recreate the filming of it uh, and tell stories and show the, the movie. It's a fascinating uh, time. If everybody's ever wanted to get immersed into that era and that story that would be a fun thing for them to do absolutely you know and i love that that there's there's very few movies you, you, you know if, if we're coming up on a break i'll save this but <laughs> oh um, we've, we've got about three minutes all right I'll, I'll, I'll very quickly start this and then we can revisit this if you'd like but you know my last book was a deep dive look at the shawshank redemption yeah and you know shawshank redemption was shot here in ohio in 93 and uh, it grew out of a different book, but that's, you know, for later. Uh, but it was 95% of it was filmed in central Ohio. And all those places, including the Ohio State Reformatory, which was Shawshank State Prison, are there. And they've created this Shawshank Trail where you can drive around to like 15, 16 different filming sites and see. And you can put your hand on it. Yeah. You can actually step into the And that's what Mackinac Island is like. You can step onto the set. It's, you're there. Yeah. Most films are shot on, on, on sound stages in Hollywood, and they tear everything down, and they throw everything out, and even when they shoot on location, they tend to tear everything down. These are two films, where rare films, where you can actually go somewhere, do a pilgrimage, and actually feel like you're inside the movie, oh, because everything is still standing. And, and Mark, they encourage you to dress up in 1910 garb and bring your change of clothing and your costume along with you. And then they have the same uh, food. They have uh, all sorts of interesting things that they go through for that entire uh, weekend. Uh, you're immersed into not only the film, but in the era as well. Yeah. And it was almost all shot there. It's like you say, you know, you, you think about what, if you want to connect to the Godfather. Maybe yeah. you could go to a, a filming site here or there or the Exorcist. Oh, there are the stairways they used in Georgetown. But there's a, here, these are two films where you can see literally almost every place they filmed. 
Yeah. Say, this was shot here. This was where he stood. This was where I can put my hand on it. I can put, I can touch it. I can feel it. That's such a rare thing. Yeah. The movie. And those are two very rare movies that you can do that with. As a matter of fact, I've even heard that they can actually uh, have you recreate parts of certain scenes if you want to take a character and be filmed doing that. Can you imagine? That would be a fun thing to do, you know. Gee, we got to take a break here uh, at the top of the hour, and we're going to come back with uh, more. But I am just relishing our time together tonight. So thank you for, uh, for all you're doing. We're going to be right back with more of Spaced Out Sunday in just a moment. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no. Hey, space travelers! This is John Resig, the founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. If you know anything about our website, you know we like to do things a little differently. We're not some faceless organization collecting money for a nebulous cause. Our donor dollars go directly toward life-improving items. Then we give those items directly to an underdog who needs it most. To become a donor with Spaced Out Radio's official charity, Chive Charities. Just go to ChiveCharities.org forward slash donate. Are you an experiencer of something strange that can't be explained? Do you want help finding out what's going on? I'm Ryan Stacy, head of the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESSA. We've teamed up with Spaced Out Radio to investigate cases filled out in the SOR Sightlines Report. We are independent and there's no cost to what we do. All we need is your experience. Let's find out what's happening together on the SOR Sightlines Report. We are scouring the world for the most intriguing stories of your day. Take the time to read up on the SOR Newswire, where our team, led by Captain Shirk, will deliver to you some of the best paranormal and supernatural news, along with some stories that will blow your mind from the weird to the wacky. It's the news outside the news that piques interest, and that's what we're looking to deliver to you. The SOR Newswire, only at spacedoutradio.com. Hi there, this is Dave Scott, and I'm bringing you the woo every Monday through Friday on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going all out to bring you the strangest, oddest stories and subjects I could find for your entertainment. Why? Because when we hit peak woo, I know I've done my job. So come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com, 906 Pacific, 1206 AM Eastern, and together, my friends, we own the night. The SOR Vault is open for business, and do we have some cool swag for you to pick up? All you have to do is head over to our website and click on the SOR Vault. You have a variety of cool logos to choose from and put them on anything you want. T-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, you name it, we can get it to you. So do your shopping by supporting the story you love. Get your Spaced Out Radio swag at the SOR Vault today. If you like it hot, real hot, then heat up your meals with Bumblefoot Hot Sauce. Get your Bumblefoot hot sauce today. The sauce, Bumblelicious, and the 4 million Scoville unit, Bumble f- We're going in hot, real hot, coming out even hotter. Keep the milk nearby. And tantalize your taste buds tonight. Bumblefoot hot sauce, available now at kajans.com. Hello, space travelers. It's me again, Carl. Don't forget to join the Space Travelers Club for just five bucks a month and follow Spaced Out Radio on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Our Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. Our Facebook page is Spaced Out Radio Show. Our archives are free at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Come woo it up with Spaced Out Radio today. Bye! We all know on Spaced Out Radio we love a good beard and mustache, so why not take care of your facial hair with Mighty Moose Beard Oil? Made in Canada, we're taking care of beards and stashes around the world. We use 100% natural ingredients with our oils and balms to make your whiskers feel silky smooth. Use promo code SOR2019 at MightyMooseBeard.com today. Looking for creative ways to get your company out in the public? How about advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Our sales department is waiting to hear from you, and we can work around any budget. 
From commercial spots to banners to special promotions, there are many opportunities to get your name and product out to our SOR listeners. For a price guide and more information, please contact us at sales at space.radio.com. Get your horns up with me on Spaced Out Radio. This is Ron Bumblefoot Thaw. Come tune in to SOR where you can hear me rock out with Little Brother is Watching, the official theme song of Spaced Out Radio. And then come on over to Bumblefoot.com where you can find out about my tour schedule, my music, and everything else. Bumblefoot.com keeps you up to date on what I'm doing and the best way to stay in touch with my music and music camps. Sign up for my newsletter at Bumblefoot.com and remember, Little Brother is Watching. Hi. This is Amber Beckrude, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we store all of the SOR show archives for free. And as an added bonus, every two weeks, I'm posting brand new content on Cryptid Tales, where I will get into some of the spookier legends and folklore from around the world and tell the stories that go with them. Find us at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio and check out Cryptid Tales today. Drop a comment and let me know what you want to hear. See you there. For the price of one cup of coffee a month, you can become an SOR Space Traveler. The Space Travelers Club is a place where you can interact with other listeners, either live during the show or on our great forum. We want your stories, pictures, comments, and ideas. You'll get live video streams, exclusive content, and be a part of our newsletter. Stay in touch with everything SOR. The Space Travelers Club is just five bucks a month at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everyone, I'm John Edwards. And I'm Stacy Edwards. Together we're taking over Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio where we're going to bring our own experiences of the paranormal and talk to the best people we can find to help bring you answers to your strange tales. We're here to entertain your need for weekend. Woo! So tune us in at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern where we can all get a little spooky together. Spaced Out Saturday nights right here at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Sunday. I am your host, Michael W. Hall. Thanks for being with us tonight. We welcome back everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates. WQEE 99.1 FM in Noonan, Georgia. And in UPRN 107.7 FM in New Orleans. On the digital side, we are also on Revolution Radio. Don't forget, you can always check out our archives at youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Do us all a favor and hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to some Bumblefoot, shopping in our spaced out radio store, and catching up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire and so much more. And boy, are we having a heck of a time tonight with my special guest, Mark uh, DeWidziak. And we are just talking all sorts of great stuff about uh, theatrical. We're talking about literary. We're talking about uh, horror and fantasy as well. So thank you again, uh, Mark, for all your time tonight. We... uh, we, we seem to be on a roll. We've only got one hour left, and I tell you what, two hours have just flown by. Uh, so I need to get uh, some of these questions in uh, to ask uh, that, that before I leave, leave with you. But also, I al- always want to allow my guest uh, to bring up an, a subject that they would really like to make sure that we cover uh, and that I haven't asked yet. Uh, just so if something else comes up that uh, that you need to get across to us, feel free to uh, bring it up as we go through this thing. Okay. I, 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 you know, I think you're doing great, Michael. <laughs> so you just go ahead and ask me anything. You know, I am. I always say this to the host, uh, which is I'm always much better when I don't know what you're going to ask me. You yeah. Know, I'm always much better responding candidly, you know, because you know this as a lawyer. You know, lawyers make terrible witnesses, you know, yeah. because lawyers like to anticipate the cross-examination process. So, you know, they always the, the cliche is that always lawyers make worse witnesses. Uh, and I think, you know, the same thing is that if you ask somebody who interviews people for it, I know the questions, I'll prepare for them. 
So I, I, I always say I'd rather not know. I, a thousand, I'm a much better when I don't know, you know, because yeah. it, sort of, it also turns into real conversation, which is always much more value. No, you, so. you, you've proven that already in two hours yeah. of, uh, you know, ext- extemporaneous, uh, you know, answers to the, some of these questions. You know, something just came into my mind. Um, I had an opportunity uh, as a tour guide to get to know uh, uh, Chris Matheson, uh, Richard's son. Uh, well, yeah. What what is he doing now lately? Do you do you have any idea? Oh yeah, he's still writing. And as a matter of fact, uh, this coming Saturday is the usually this time of year there is a Twilight Zone festival. Yes, uh, in in Binghamton, New York. Right, where uh, the clan gathers, uh, the Twilight Zone aficionados and fans of all types. Uh, I've gone for the last three years. It's a it's great fun. My wife and I do a stage version of my Twilight Zone book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone. We did that, staged it there the first year. So it's a lot of fun. Um, and this year, they're doing a panel. They're going to they're going to do it digital this this this. This Saturday, because obviously the, yeah. the pandemic has had its way with us, so we're going to do a, um, a a virtual day, and it's going to be all day panels. And one of them, which I think I'm, I'm most excited about, I'm doing one, but I think I'm far more excited about the fact that they're going to do a panel where they get the children of the Twilight Zone together. It's going to be R.C. Matheson, who is a writer. Cool. Son, oh, fantastic. Chris Beaumont, Charles Beaumont son and Ann Serling are all going to do a panel together. I think that's fabulous it's because they're all writers. They are all gifted writers in their own right. Anne wrote a wonderful book about her dad uh, called As I Knew Him, My oh. Father Rod Serling. It is a magnificent book. And it is now while I've been very, very fortunate to say, you know, I've gotten to meet and befriend people like Harlan Ellison and Richard Matheson and Ray Bradbury, um, I never got a chance to meet Rod Serling. Rod Serling died in 1975 when I was in my, uh, between my uh, uh, freshman and uh, uh, sophomore year of college. And in fact, he died in Rochester, New York, and I was driving through upstate New York when I heard the news on the car radio. Oh, my. I was not that far away from where he was. I'll never forget that is that that's, you know, you never forget something like that when one of your heroes died. Yeah. So, um, and, uh, you know, years later I got to, to befriend a writer named Serling and, uh, and his daughter who, who is just a wonderful writer, a wonderful person. And, and ended up writing the forward to my book, uh, on, on the twilight. So, Oh, wonderful. Things always sort of come around, don't they? They always yeah. sort of, you know, and, um, and Richard was, you know, I, I, I at that point had known Richard for, for many years by the time I did the Twilight Zone book. So I got a lot of insights about the Twilight Zone from him because, you know, he wrote so many classic episodes. He wrote Nightmare at 20,000 Feet with the Gremlin on the Wing. Yeah. He wrote The Invaders with Agnes Moorhead as the woman in the farmhouse. Oh, yeah. So he wrote so many great Twilight Zone episodes. And uh, he was just perfect for it. He's just, he one of the things that Rod Serling did in that first year was he went and he recruited uh, writers who could write that sort of thing. And the, the two right, first two the writers he went to were Charles Beaumont and, and, and Richard Matheson. So he got two of the very, very best. And, uh, and, and it, it, it sounds to me uh, that uh, Rod Serling had the clout to do it the way he wanted to do it at the time. It sounds to me. You know, the interesting thing about the Twilight Zone is this, is that um, Rod was, up to that point of the Twilight Zone, Rod was not a fantasy writer. There was nothing in Rod's face. I mean, he comes out of World War II. He was in the South Pacific as a paratrooper. He was doing a very dangerous job in a very dangerous place. He gets out of the war. He doesn't really know what he wants to do. And um, he goes to Antioch College because his brother had gone to Antioch College here in Ohio. And it's here that he discovers writing, and he gets out of the war damaged uh, uh, emotionally and physically. He, he carries shrapnel around in his knee for the rest of his life. Um, and he learns that you can cathartically work through things through writing. And uh, he then parlays that into a writing career and gradually builds his credentials to become one of the great writers 
of live television in the 1950s. He and Patty Shayevsky are probably the two young lions who emerge as the greatest writers of that generation. The problem was that going into the 1950s, television is sort of the Wild West. It's the young medium. It's new. Everybody's sort of making it up as they go along. And it's very exciting to be part of it. By the end of the 50s, it's become an industry. And all of a sudden, there's nothing but rules. You can't say this because the sponsor will get upset. You can't say this because those stations will get upset. You can't say this because the standards and practices people are going to get... And all of a sudden, getting the message across was tougher and tougher. So in 1959, Rod rolls the dice, and he decides to open the Twilight Zone for business. And his, his theory here is that he can say everything that he was saying in dramas, but if he hides it in fantasy, nobody's going to say anything. And he'll get the message across through the metaphor of fantasy. And there's this wonderful interview that he did right before the Twilight Zone started. You can see it on YouTube if you want to find it. He does it with Mike Wallace. Mike Wallace is uh, a few years away from 60 Minutes, but he's still, you know, yeah. snarky Wallace, you know. And he's, they're both smoking like stacks here, you know. It's just, they're both going away. Yeah. And at some point in the interview, Mike Wallace and his snarky Mike Wallace says, well, he says to Rod Sarley, well, Rod, you're doing this thing called the Twilight Zone. I guess we can figure that you're done with serious writing for now. And there's this like slight pause. <laughs> and the magician can't give away his trick. Ron <clears throat> can't say what he's about to do. So he just says, yeah, Mike, you're right. I'm done with serious writing. For now. And then he goes on and he, he does the most important thing that he's ever done by doing the Twilight Zone. And the whole idea was that um, I, do a, I do a talk which compares... Uh, this is going to dovetail to what we've already talked about, which compares the personal and professional lives of Rod Serling and Mark Twain. And the, the name of the talk is Marlis in Disguise. And that comes from a phrase that it was actually, it was Mark Twain's phrase. He had gotten, late in life, he had gotten a letter from a little French girl named Helene Picard. And this little girl had sent him a letter, and what she wrote was, I know that most people think of you as a very funny man and as a humorist, but I get the sense that behind all of the joking, you're trying to tell us something. And Twain sent her back a letter in which he basically said, Shh, <laughs> you got it. You're on it. But don't tell anybody. I am a moralist in disguise. Wow. Now, is there a better phrase description of Rod Serling? <clears throat> very that, good. Very and moral in disguise, and that's what the Twilight Zones are. They all, each and every one of them, is a parable. You know, it's it's the best kind of storytelling. You know, it's just like parables. Where have we heard that before? You know, and I know a lot of people are going to say, "Oh, you mean the New Testament now, right?" And I say, "Well, even before the New Testament, <clears throat> let's go all the way back to Greek storytelling and Aesop's fables." Yes, where every Aesop's fable always ended up with, and the moral of the story is. Yes. Well, every Twilight Zone had a moral. It was a, it had a moral purpose. And that's why those stories are as powerful today as they were when they first aired. And matter of fact, a lot of the stories are more powerful today and more resonant today than when they aired. I'll think of one that I'll give you, and it's because, you know, it kind of fits the nature of, of, of your show, and, and it's but it, the monsters are due on Maple Street. Yeah. And the monsters are due on Maple Street is, you know, the story of a perfect suburban neighborhood, seemingly perfect, on a summer day, and a bright light goes across, they think it's a meteor, and then all of a sudden nothing works. The phones don't work, radios don't work, the cars don't work, it doesn't matter what it's fueled by, it doesn't work. And a little, a little boy says, this is the way it happens in all the stories. And they always send people ahead who look just like us. Now everybody's looking at each other. <laughs> Who's the alien? You know, which is, and everybody starts to pick each other apart. Now Rod was using this as a a Cold War metaphor. He was talking about the McCarthy era and the Red Scare, when everybody looked at their neighbors with suspicion. Could you be a communist? And suspicion and fear could drive people apart. He was definitely writing about that, the Red Scare. Yeah. 
Yeah. But you watch that episode now at a time when, you know, as a country, we are more divided than any time since the Civil War. And you realize that the moral of this story is divided, we fall. If we do not find a way to communicate, if we do not find a way to talk to each other, we ain't going to make it, folks. And this is what Rod was trying to say in 1959. And that story is as powerful today as ever. And there's a fifth grade class in Binghamton, New York, Rod's hometown, where they teach the Twilight Zone uh, as, 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 as morality tales. And at the end of the, they, they, they showed this class, fifth graders, they showed the class, Monsters Are Due on Maple Street. And at the end of the story, the teacher said to the children, who are the monsters? And they all stood up. Wow. Every single one of them stood up. Oh, my goodness. And that's how good that story still is. Yes. And that's, and that's why The Twilight Zone, a black and white show from 1959, <laughs> still has enormous power and resonance today. Because parables do not fall out of uh, out of favor. They are as good. You can be talking about a parable which was in, told in ancient Greek times, and it's as good as it was then. And that's what the Twilight Zone is. Oh, definitely. And it, and, and it set up everything. Because right away, you know, who picks up the baton from, from, from Rod? Gene Roddenberry. You know, yeah. the Twilight Zone was off the air in 64. Star Trek begins in 66. Yeah. And Roddenberry said he went to school on, on watching what Rod did. And he understood what Rod understood, which is that if you put it on a spaceship and send it out to Alpha Centauri, you can talk about anything. You can talk about prejudice, bigotry, hatred, war. You can talk about anything you want that the senses wouldn't let you talk about in a regular drama. Yes. And that leads right on down. And then that leads to Night Stalker in the, in, in, in the 70s. And Night Stalker leads to the X-Files. And X-Files <laughs> leads to Supernatural. And it just it's rolling thunder all the way through. But the Twilight Zone is sort of the headwaters to the whole thing. Oh my! And like, yeah, metaphoric storytelling. And you know, to to carry on the metaphor, um, there is that uh, television series on history called uh, Unidentified. You know, with yeah. Lou Elizondo and the two the Stars Academy guys, um, they are doing the hybrid thing, where in reality this is not, uh, you know, fantasy any longer, supposedly. So that's mm -hmm. interesting too. Yeah, you know it. <clears throat> It, it in many ways, and the other thing about the Twilight Zone is that it was, it's about broadening your horizons. It's about, you know, you watch the Twilight Zone, and especially if you get it as, you know, a kid. You know, if you get it as a kid, it just, you're not even sure what you're watching. Look, I saw the Twilight Zone when I was first time with it. I was 10 years old. I was too young to see it in its original run, but dear old WPIX again started re showing it in reruns almost immediately. So I started watching it in reruns when I was about 10. And when I was 10, I liked it for the same reason you like anything when you're 10, for that wonderful spooky feeling that the hairs on the back of your neck would go up at the very end when you got those wonderful payoffs. Yeah. That was why I liked The Twilight Zone at 10. And then when I started to watch them, you know, as a teenager, you kind of realize there's something more going on here. But if the gun gets loaded at 10, up here, then your 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 horizons are broad. You know, Rod's every opening of the Twilight Zone said that the Twilight Zone was what it was as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. And it means that you know, your perception is wide open. You're, you know, you're, you're, anything is possible at that age. And so it's very important to get that kind of storytelling when you're when you're that young. It's very important to be exposed to that kind of storytelling because even if you don't know you're getting it. It'll, it'll catch up with you later on. And as you go, then as you, you know, into your, your young adult years, if you have those horizons open, you're ready. You're ready to, 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 to fully explore the world around you. Instead of it becoming like this, it goes like this. Yeah. yeah. By, by the way, um, I don't know if you've seen that uh, small, very low-budget film on Netflix I think it's Netflix, either that or Amazon Prime, called uh, Vast of Night. Yes, I have. Isn't that fascinating? That's, that's, 
Yeah. You know, somebody asked me this just the other day. We were talking about, they said, you know, um, have you seen anything that's good um, in the uh, sort of the fantasy, horror, science fiction realm in the last like 10 years? And I said, I've seen a lot that's good in the last 10 years. The, the, the thing is, not all, but a lot of it has been on television. Because that's where a lot of, and that's just a matter of economic realities, is that the movies increasingly are made and marketed to a younger and younger demographic. Uh, you know, the older you get, the, the less you go to the movies. And so they go where the ticket sales are. So, you know, if you see a horror film and you see a movie that's going to be true, it's it, not to say that people like Guillermo del Toro are not doing really good horror on the big screen. They certainly are. Or Jordan Peele uh, with a movie like Get Out. But most horror films are Hostel 15 or something like that. And really good horror has been done consistently uh, over the last 15, actually since the 90s in Buffy the Vampire Slayer and, and the X-Files. That double bill in the 90s, you know, really set everything up. And then you had stuff like Penny Dreadful and True Blood and uh, you know, some really, really good, well done stuff all the way up to today. Um you know, the first years of The Walking Dead. Nobody should discount those first years. I mean, everybody kind of now talks about it and what it turned into, which is, you know, it, it sort of jumped off the rails a few seasons in. But all of the, 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 the this stuff, there's been some very good, intelligent uh, fantasy, science fiction, horror stuff, genre, what we call genre stuff, I guess, has been done on television. And so I don't care that the movies aren't doing it, as long as somebody's doing it. Yeah. As long as it's being done somewhere. That, that's good. No, it's amazing, too, that um, during this, uh, of course, there's a big dearth right now of uh, theatrical productions. Big studios are all closed down you know, during this COVID thing and stuff. It's going to be interesting to see how that changes the genre um, uh, on the new normal, on how we're going to deal with low budget, you know, uh, you know kind of productions as uh, as we come out of this. It might make it better. It might. It, what, what might happen is that you have to all of a sudden focus more on human emotions and character development <laughs> and themes, and not so much CGI. Um, yeah. You, you know, and it's not going to be so much a roller coaster ride. Uh, you know, good storytelling is about good characters, and so I, I actually think there's a chance. The other thing is, which is I think is even more important, is that. Uh, you cannot write a sonnet in your time and not be influenced by what's going on in your time. And it always comes out, especially in the science fiction and horror and fantasy, metaphorically, it always gets reflected in those things. The first great vampire movie was Nosferatu in 1922, completely shaped by a pandemic, completely shaped by the Spanish influenza. Yeah, uh, good you know, point, good point. That vampire looks like a rodent. It looks like a rat. It looks like no other vampire is going to look later on unless they intentionally are mimicking those Ferratu. And the reason is because the, the film is set in the 1830s in Bremen, in Germany, Port City, and it's all about the plague coming to Germany, echoing the Spanish influenza. Why does the vampire look like a rat? Because they thought rats were what were spreading the plague. It was actually the fleas on the rats that were the real culprits, but the rats were the carriers, so they became the face of plague. And therefore, that vampire looks like it. Metaphor, it came out immediately. Immediately, it's metaphoric. So what's going on today, the, what you watch, whatever happens in, in, in those areas over the next few years, it's going to be shaped by what's happening right now in history and culture. It has to be. It always is. You know, that's the course I teach in, on vampires. I'll go decade by decade and say, this vampire looks this way because guess what? This was what was happening in the culture at the time. This was what was happening in history. It had to look this way. It had to come up. The vampire does not shape us. We shape it. We shape it to fit our needs of the moment, our, 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 our storytelling, our metaphoric needs. So we make the vampire look and act a certain way. And it always reflects the fears and hopes and aspirations and nightmares of the moment. Oh, and my. It never changes. It, that part never changes. So, um, 
So whatever has happening today, and you have a lot happening today, you have a lot of uncertainty and fear. In the horror of the next 10 years, all of that's going to come out. And it's going to be very potent. It's going to be very, very strong and very potent. Yes. I'm, looking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what, so you, who does what with this form well it comes it comes back exactly what you said uh when you talked with uh uh stephen king the idea that uh horror uh has to get those things out comedy keeps it in but horror is going to re uh re uh basically get all of this stuff out eventually and that's what we're going to be dealing with for the next decade for sure i think you know horror and humor are twins they are flip sides of the same coin. And we use them in very similar ways. They're even similar words. Humor, horror. They're both two-syllable words starting in H, ending in R. And they look like mirror images. Um, Good point. Like the two of them is that, you know, we and we use them both to wrap our minds around things which are uncomfortable, things we don't like to think about. The number one thing being, you know, death. Death is the big one. I mean, it's always the, the notion that, our ticket's been stamped, and we just don't know what our departure time is. Yes. Uh, you know, nobody's really entirely comfortable with that thought. Yeah. Uh, but every kind of fear and uncertainty, humor and horror give us metaphoric devices for dealing with all of those really big topics, and they tend to tackle big topics. Oh, um, well, so they're, 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 it's extraordinarily mirrors of their time. Well, well said. We're going to take our final break here. And we're going to be right back with Spaced Out Sunday in just a few moments. Need that weekend supernatural fix? Look no further than Spaced Out Saturday right here at spacedoutradio.com. I'm Stacy Edwards. And I'm John Edwards. Each Saturday night, Stacy and I are going to bring you the best in paranormal, cryptids, UFOs, you name it, and we're going there. It's all about the experience and to share the knowledge with all of you. So tune us in every Saturday night on Spaced Out Saturdays starting at 9.06 p.m. Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. I'm feeling a little spicy tonight. What to do? What to do? Why not get Bumblefoot? Four million Scoville units of pure hard rock. Bumblefoot hot sauces come in three flavors. The burning bumble. Tone it down a bit with Bumblelicious and throw the sauce on everything. Spicing up. Bumble me, baby. Bumblefoot hot sauce. Get it today at kajans.com. Are you looking for great advertising value for your company? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. We have a multitude of places to get your name out there, including commercial ads during the show, special promotions, and banners on our website. Our audience has proven to support the companies that support our show. We can make your budget work for you. So for more information, please contact us at sales at spacedoutradio.com. Hey everybody, the SOR Space Travelers is open. For just five bucks a month, you can hang out with Dave and our crew privately in our members only section. With your signing, you'll receive newsletters on what's going on with Spaced Out Radio. You'll have direct contact with the host during the show in our chat, live streaming videos, and a great forum for your posts and more. Become a space traveler now at spacedoutradio.com. You wanted new SOR gear, and now you can have it. The SOR Vault is fully stocked with t-shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and everything in between with great logos for you to choose from. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com, click on the SOR Vault, and go shopping. Pricing is quite affordable, and you can look good representing your favorite show. So go to our website and pick up your new SOR wear at the SOR Vault today. Are you addicted to the woo? Good. Me too. This is Dave Scott, and you can woo it up with me every Monday through Friday, starting at 9.06 Pacific, 12.06 a.m. Eastern, for three hours of great entertainment in the subjects you love. UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, intuition, yes, we hit it all five days a week. Look for us at spacedoutradio.com, where together, my friends, we own the night. At spacedoutradio.com, we are keeping you up to date on all the news with the SOR Newswire. 
Captain Shirk leads the team that is bringing you the news of the day and exclusive stories on everything paranormal and supernatural. It's free to read, it's updated daily, and it's right there for you. The SOR Newswire is a one-stop shop for the news of the day. Check it out at spacedoutradio.com today. Hello, everyone. This is Ryan Stacy from the Experiencer Support Association, otherwise known as TESA. We're glad to team up with Spaced Out Radio to help investigate your experiences on the SOR Sightlines Report. Together, we'll investigate the strange sightings and occurrences you've had. We're looking for answers just like you. So fill out a Sightlines Report on the Spaced Out Radio website, and let's figure out what's going on together. Hey Spaced Out Radio fans, it's John Rezig, founder of the Chive and Chive Charities. Our goal is to make the life of veterans, first responders, and those with rare medical conditions 10% happier. We do this by donating one grant item, ranging from dance to therapy programs to prosthetic limbs, to those who need it most. To contribute to Spaced Out Radio's official charity, head over to chivecharities.org and become a donor today. Hello, this is your guitar man, Ron Bumblefoot Thaw, and I have to tell you, I love the response I get for Little Brother is Watching from Spaced Out Radio fans. It's amazing how music can inspire and make people think deeper about what's going on in the supernatural world. You can head over to my website, bumblefoot.com, to check out my music, my guitar workshops, my touring, even check out some of the hot sauces that I'm working on. And make sure you keep on listening, because with Spaced Out Radio, you know Little Brother is Watching. From the heartlands of Canada to beards around the world, we know how to take care of you. Fill your follicles with the Mighty Moose Beard Oil. All our oils and balms are handmade and 100% natural ingredients because we care about your beard. And hey, use the promo code SOR2019 and get your Mighty Moose Beard Oil today. You can check us out on our website, MightyMooseBeard.com. We're adding to the entertainment online for Spaced Out Radio. I'm Amber Beckard, and I want to invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out Cryptid Tales, where I will take you on a journey into some of the strangest legends and lore from around the world, relaying the stories to you of the strange creatures and experiences that people have had throughout time. You can find Cryptid Tales at youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. And while you're there, don't forget to check out our free archives and leave a comment. See you there. And we are back here with Mark DeWiziak, and we are having a fun time. We've got just a little less than a half hour to go here, and I'm going to be sad to see this uh, this show over with. I tell you what, I'm having a great time. You know, I got to thinking, uh, Mark, you were mentioning the children of the Twilight Zone, you know, with uh, R.C. and some of these guys, you know, kind of carrying on the uh, the torch what, what about your daughter, Becky? Is is she into this kind of whole thing? Or what, what's going on with her and her career? Interesting you ask that. Uh, Becky is a, uh, a very gifted writer and photographer. Uh, she, as a matter of fact, uh, Becky took uh, all, all the original pictures that were in my Shawshank Redemption book. Uh, the uh, She went with me on all my research trips. And uh, there's about 55 pictures in the book, and half of them she took. Um, so the, she, she has a real hand in that book and that was kind of a, it was wonderful sort of, uh, traveling and interviewing people and being able to share that whole experience with her. But, um, she's also, you know, I think in her heart of hearts, uh, she'd like to be a writer and, uh, you know, she's going to start her, uh, uh, work towards a master's degree this, this fall. So, you oh. know, she's, uh, Oh, good for yeah. her. Is but this very much into you know that like I say she's uh, um, she's always like fantasy uh, uh, storytelling I think more than anything like 
when she was young, uh, I think her favorite books were the Narnia books. You know, oh, probably were you know, the yeah. C.S. Lewis books. Of course. Uh, uh, so I think that that's, uh, you know, it, it kind of shaped her sensibility right from the start. Oh my! Well, listen, with her abil- ability of uh, photography and and writing as well, I mean, she could come up with with her own Polar Express picture book. Wouldn't that be awesome? Something like that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what she's going to do because, like I say, she's you know she she loves you know the fire is is for writing. I think you know when she got spare moments, she tends to be working on stories, you know, and working on on on, on that. So. You know, I've, I've said for a long time, I, I, you know, I'm not sure whether this is a curse or a blessing, but I think you're a writer, you know, so. Yeah, it, it is a two-edged sword, isn't it, you know? Oh, yeah. oh, oh, you know, look, it's, it's, it is that, that famous uh, Dorothy Parker line about, uh, you know, that if, if a young person comes up to you and says that they want to be a writer, uh, the second thing you should do for them is to get them a copy of the elements of style by Strunk and white, because it's the most important book they'll ever have on writing. And somebody said, what's the first thing? They said, Shoot them while they're still happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> so, you know, and I love, and I, I love the way you tell it too, with the punchline coming later, you know, mm-hmm. after the first uh, serious part. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, well, it is. You know, I think that's one reason I was drawn to. We haven't talked about this much, but I think it's one of the reasons I was drawn to the Kolshak character so much. Is that, uh, you know, I actually became a journalist because of that character. Um, that that uh, mo- first movie, the one about the, the, the Night Stalker, the, which was the one set in Las Vegas with a vampire on the loose, and is this a really well done movie, TV movie, aired on ABC in January of 1972, and. Um, I mean, that movie works for a lot of reasons, but not the least of which is just how incredibly good Darren McGavin is as the Carl Kolschak character. This person who is constantly uh, finding these these supernatural mysteries, and uh, the story is always being suppressed, but he goes on. He goes on. He's his, his character of amazing to get the truth out. You know, the whole idea of the truth is out there that the X Files is going to later pick up on you know really comes from the night chris carter said you know to anybody who would listen when he was starting the 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 x-files that the reason he started the x-files was because as a kid uh the night stalker uh scared the heck out of him so you know this is a, a very important character but to me personally it was because um i really thought you know wow you could become a reporter you know you could uh so, you know, when I was, I started my uh, career towards a, a journalism career at George Washington University in September of 1974. Uh, now, that was only weeks after Nixon resigned the presidency. Yes, you're right. And, and journalism schools were doing this, like, land office business. Every kid in America seemed to be heading towards journalism school because they thought, it was all Woodward and Bernstein and bringing down presidents, and it was this glamorous thing, and everybody was trying to guess who Deep Throat was at the time. Yep. And um, I couldn't have cared less about that. I wanted to be Carl Kolschak. I didn't want to be uh, Woodward and or Bernstein. In yeah. Instance. So if I knew if they made a movie of all the president's men, they wouldn't get anybody who looked like me to play Woodward and Bernstein. They'd get somebody who looked like Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman to play the part. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. But, you know, Cole Shack dressed badly. He always had on the same seersucker suit all the time, the same stupid pork pie hat uh, and the white sneakers. He dressed badly. He had a, you know, a European last name, which could have been Polish. And uh, when Darren McGavin decided was Polish and, uh, you know, he got there by uh, keeping his head down and often enough ended up getting his, his teeth kicked in by, you know, but he would go on. And it was more my idea of what a reporter should be. So, you know, while everybody else wanted to be Woodward and Bernstein, I wanted to be Carl Kolschak. And uh, I later found out when I became a reporter that I wasn't alone. A lot of reporters told me they became reporters because of, of the Kolschak character. You know, and when you think about it, there's only two movies and 20 episodes of that series. That That's all there is. It had an enormous influence for, you know... Uh, for there being that little. And then the second one is shot, was filmed set in Seattle. 
And then um, the series, he very quickly encountered almost every kind of supernatural uh, being that they, they could. So, there, you know, the first season, there was a vampire, there was a zombie, there was a UFO encounter, there's a werewolf, there's a witch. You know, that, and now had they gone to another season, they undoubtedly would have worked their way through the, uh, the, the time life man, myth, and magic books and just worked their way all the way through to every, you know, supernatural phenomenon they could have to keep, you know, uh, for that. Yeah. Um, you know, they would have worked their way through Native American legends. They would have worked their way through all sorts of, of things. I, you know, sort of like what the X-Files did later on. Yeah. But they only had those. But but that character, like I said, it, it had an enormous impact on me. So, you know, when you, you know, you then grow up and you get to be sort of the custodian of the character, you know, uh, you, you know, I've written, uh, two uh, nonfiction books about the character, a, a novel, uh, and a few short stories and a novella, all featuring the Kolshak character. You know, so, um, you know, he, he, Carl Kolshak's been very, very good to me. You know, <laughs> I can't, I've got, I got to say, he's been, uh, oh, yeah. And association has been very rewarding. What, what about uh, Darren McGavin? Uh, is there any uh, inside stories that you can tell us about him? Darren, um, you know, the interesting thing about Darren was, uh, now he did the, the movie and then he did the sequel and then he did 20 episodes. The only part of that that Darren liked was the first movie. Darren, he was, was more than willing to talk in great length about anything I wanted to ask him about Kolshak as far as the series was concerned. He was very candid. He was sincerely very open to talking about the second movie, which they filmed in Seattle. Um, but the only thing he really thought was any good was the first movie. And Kolshak fans don't want to hear this. They really don't want to hear their hero uh, or the person who played their, the hero saying, well, you know, it was all well and good, but the first movie was the only thing that was a fresh idea. Everything else was sort of a repeat of what the first movie was. Now, from mm -hmm. Darren's standpoint, they were just sort of reinventing the wheel every time. Yeah. Uh, out. And uh, mm -hmm. I think that's selling what they did pretty short. I think, you know, the, uh, the series is pretty remarkable in a lot of ways. Not to say that they didn't have... The problem with the series was, was, was largely that it was the poor stepchild on the Universal lot. You know, the, the ABC had done the two movies, and they'd done it through ABC Circle Films, their, their TV movie unit. And then ABC license, uh, Universal licensed the character to do the series. At the time, there was a real pecking order on the Universal lot. And the high end of the pecking order was Columbo. There was nothing higher than working on Columbo. That was done to a fare thee well. It yeah. was it got the biggest budget. It was the most prestigious show. It won the Emmys. And then you worked. And if, at that time, Universal made a lot of television. They were big. I mean, they were one of the major producers of TV shows. And if you work down the pecking order, you go through McLeod, Millen and Wife, and you work your way all the way to, And at the very bottom rung was Night Stalker. You know, so, you know, if you couldn't do work for anything else, you ended up now. From that, some amazing talents came out of that. The story editor on Night Stalker was a kid named David Chase, who went on to create The Sopranos. Not bad. Wow. Uh, one of the people, young writers, baby writers on the Universal lot who made his first sale to uh, Night Stalker was a kid by the name of Bob Zemeckis. He's going to oh. go on to do Back to the Future. Oh, my. Who Framed Roger Rabbit, uh, <laughs> Forrest Gump, uh, you know. Uh, so they had these kind of young writers who couldn't work on any of the shows, but they got their first sale. So they lucked into some really big talent. But there were almost no established horror writers who worked on Night Stalker, on the series. The only established horror writer who worked on that show was a guy by the name of Jimmy Sangster. Now, everybody out there who is a Hammer Horror film fan right now is shaking their head going, Jimmy Sangster. Oh, because Jimmy Sangster wrote most of the great Hammer Horror. He wrote A Horror of Dracula with Christopher Lee. and wrote Curse of Frankenstein with Peter Cush and Christopher Lee. And uh, he was the only real true horror writer who worked on that show. And his episode is, 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 is considered by many, including me, to be the best episode they did. Um, and it was called Horror in the Heights. Not only because it had a metaphoric punch to it, because it was sort of about aging and neighborhoods aging and what happens to people when that happens. 
but it also had a great idea. Great ideas in horror are hen's teeth. Most great horror stories are just retellings of established tropes. You know, the horror, the haunted house story, the vampire story. Uh, and some are very good, but, you know, a really good original idea or an idea they go, oh, well, that's really good. Well, Horror Nights is a great idea. And the great idea is this. They used a in- Indian Hindu demon legend called the Rakshasha. And the Rakshasha is a demon spirit who comes to you in the form of the person you trust the most. That could be your best friend. could be your spouse. It could be a teacher, a mentor, a parent. Imagine a monster coming towards you that takes the form of the person you trust. Well, that's just a great idea. Yeah. That's a fantastic idea. It's, it's eerie and spooky. And, and, and Kolshak thinks he's safe because he doesn't think he trusts anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great character piece. And uh, it's a little gem in the middle of it all. And it's also using a, um, a, a really nifty uh, piece of, of, of mythology uh, to, do, to, to, to do it. So they had their moments. Yeah. They had their moments. And they actually did one of the best UFO stories. You know, if I were going to do like the top five UFO stories done for television over the years, this one would be in the top five. And because they had no budget, like we were talking about before, yeah, they did this completely with like an unseen presence, and it's eerie as all get out because oh. of it, you know. Because and and again, it 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 sort of anticipates that whole Men in Black idea way before any of that, because you know there's the government coming in to shut things down when he's discovering all of this, and uh, they really did a nifty job with that episode. That's that is also in the the top echelon of the episodes they did oh i'm gonna have to check that one out for sure oh Mm -hmm. fast and by the way um what's your opinion i mean if indeed i thought um darren mcgavin would have been way high compared to like you were mentioning the pecking order at universal you know and uh the nice stalker was down at the bottom how did they convince darren mcgavin to take that part that's a big part of the book um and so it was a big part of why it was such a bad experience for Darren. Um, Darren had done the movie, the first movie, he loved it. Then they convinced him to do the second movie, and he just thought it was a retread. So when they came to him to do the series, uh, he said no. And they, there were a couple of execs at Universal. Uh, one guy named Marty Singer, who was just on him saying, come on, come on, do Night Star. Come on, let's do it as a series. Let's do it as a series. And he just kept saying no. And finally, they were all at a party together. And you remember Sid Sheinberg was running Universal at the time. Oh, yeah. And they had a party at Sid Sheinberg's house. And Marty was getting all over Darren. And Darren was saying, hey, you know, knock it off, Marty. We're at a party. you know." And, and Sid overheard them and said, what, what's going on here? What's, what are you guys talking about? And Darren said, well, he, Marty wants me to do a series based on Night Stalker. And I, and I don't want to do it. And Sid said, well, let's talk about it. Well, you know. What, what, what would you? What would it take to make you want to do it? And Darren said, you know, that um, he wanted to be the executive producer. He wanted to be have an executive producer credit. So they promised him he could be executive producer, and they had no intention of keeping that promise. They weren't going to let an actor be the executive producer on on the series. So uh, when Darren committed to it, they they then assigned a producer, and. This created two camps, two two kind of two camps on the show. So it was a terrible experience. It was terrible for everybody. Everybody was caught in the middle, and it was all Universal's doing. This wasn't the fault of the producers because the producers were good producers who really talented, gifted producers. A guy by the name of Cy Shermack ended up being the assigned producer on it, and and Cy's just done incredible work. As a matter of fact, he was known as the guy who could help save shows. Um, but you know, he was put into this position where Darren was acting like the producer when he didn't have the producer's credit. And the other guy was the actual producer. So it, it created a very tense, bad situation. Universal mishandled it as badly as you could possibly do it. And then the shooting schedules were all at night. Darren was not having a good time. Wow. 
Yeah. And Darren, Darren, what, and Darren said to me, you know, at one point, because I said, I've heard all these reasons why this got canceled. Low ratings. It did have terrible ratings, by the way. Probably would have got canceled regardless. Bad ratings, blah, blah, blah. Universal canceled it. ABC canceled it. I said, like, I, and Darren just looked at me and said, do you want to know who canceled Night Stalker? I canceled Night Stalker. <laughs> I said, I, I was, you know, they had a 22-episode commitment. They only made 20 episodes. It was short of their two episodes. It ended in March instead of going on the usual TV. And Darren said he went into Universal and said, cancel this thing. I don't want to be part of it anymore. And they said, well, we've got a commitment to ABC. So he went to ABC and said, cancel it. And ABC said, well, we've got this commitment to Universal. And he said, well, you two guys get together and cancel this thing. And they did, <clears> you know. So um, it, it basically was, it was a no-fun zone for Darren and you know, he, he did really didn't want to be, he, he didn't want to do any more of it and he never went and played the character again. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what a, what an incredible actor himself. Oh my. Um, oh yeah. And, 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 you know, Darren had, had done, I mean, several series before that. Yeah. And, and, you know, he did Mike Hammer. He'd done uh, the outsider, which is really good short lived series with him as a detective. He done riverboat. Um, you know, he'd done like four series before night stalker. Uh, he was well traveled, done a lot of TV movies, a lot of miniseries. So you know, and he, and he continued to to work. You know, um, it's interesting that Night Stalker became one of the role, two roles he's most identified for because the other is undoubtedly the old man in a Christmas story. Yeah, uh, you know, those are probably the two roles he's most identified with. Oh, of course, and, yeah. And uh, but and it's kind of odd that that Kolchak's the other, but Kolchak has developed this cult a cult following. <laughs> uh, which followed him right to the end. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, you know, Mark, this has been just a wonderful show tonight. Thank you so much. I want to make sure that people know how to get your materials, get your books. Uh, so why don't you go ahead and promote a little bit about yourself here and where people can find your stuff. Well, for me, the best way to, to start is, the, is is my website, which is artfully, uh, markdewitziak.com. Uh, so that'll show you all the book titles. And I'm going to warn everybody up front, it's an incredibly schizophrenic bunch of, 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 of books, <laughs> as we said, free, freely said. And it'll take you to Amazon is always a good place to start for the books that are in print. Amazon is, is always a good place to, to, to go. Uh, certainly, the Twilight Zone book just came out in paperback. Uh, we did with new with some new material. Very so nice, yeah. That's in hardcover and paperback. Everything I need to know, I love it. Learn the Twilight Zone, uh, the Shawshank Redemption book, which is called the Shawshank Redemption Revealed: uh, How One Story Keeps Hope Alive. Um, that's that's there, and three of the Mark Twain books are still in print. Um, so you know, you know, there's a, there's a fair number of, of items there that they they can find. Is, and, you know, and I'm always working on the next one. So, and know. and that's what I was just going to ask you. Uh, you probably are working on something or have something in the back of your mind. What? Am, what? No, can, what a, this what, is more than in the back of my mind. It's on my desk. It's 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 surrounding me. Um, I'm actually working on a biography of Edgar Allan Poe. Oh Green, wow! For St. Martin's, and um, I am deep in the research of, of that right now. Um, and uh, it's going to be it, it's going to be interesting because I'm going to look at the the story of his life through the mystery of his death. Oh and, my! Uh, so it's uh, it's I think it's going to be an uh, uh, an illuminating take on Poe, and we're going to knock down a lot of misconceptions about Mister Poe uh, on the way. Oh, so, that's that's quite a teaser in itself, right there. Looking yeah. at the life oh. about it and and dealing with his death. So, well. Gosh, Mark Davidziak, this has been a most incredible and enlightening and entertaining show tonight. Thank you so much for your time, and uh, we will definitely be keeping in touch with you as new things develop in your life. Well, let's please, please do. Yeah, you can tell how shy and retiring I am. I mean, <laughs> how hard it is to get me to come out of my shell. So you know, it's always uh, it's always good for me to do these sort of things. Oh, you're a consummate professional. Thank you so much again. Oh no, that's this has been fun. This is fun. And again, this is a lot of questions I haven't heard before. You know, a lot of questions that, uh, as I said, man, like I said, I said to you, I, I like to be taken by surprise. I, I like to be uh, good, good. You know, pose, you know when, when somebody has questions, and who better than a lawyer to do that? Well, I appreciate you being spontaneous like that. That's wonderful. <laughs> 
All right. Well, thank you again, Mark. You have yourself a wonderful week. Thank you, Michael. Take yep. care. Bye now. Bye now. There once was a man who had some land in eastern Washington. And on his land, this man, he had a deep, dark hole upon People came from miles around to throw their trash down in to see how deep the hole was and listen for its end. Then one day, that fateful day, they forced Mel off his land. They paid him off and sent him off down under with a plan. They hit Mel's hole and covered it up so ne'er it could be found. So no one would ever know what's deep down in Mel's ground. Yippee-yay. Well, I want to remind everyone that Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. You can find more information and music at bumblefoot.com. A very special thanks to everyone listening in at home and in your cars and at work and in the chat rooms tonight, wherever you are around the world. Remember, this show is currently copyrighted. Based Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thanks for sharing your evening with us tonight because together, my friends, we own the night. Good night, everyone. We'll see you next Sunday.